Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of June 20th, 2013. I'm City Council <laughs> President Bill White. I'm presiding. I didn't hear him say uh, We are convening at 6 o'clock because we anticipate a very heavy uh, meeting tonight and heavy in a lot of things to attend to. So that's where we're convening at 6. There will be public comment at 7 o'clock as well as two published hearings. I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Adams? Here. Present. Here. Here. Present. Here. 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 Um, and the secretary and I have parsed out the uh, agenda, and I think we'll start with we're going to deal with all the things that uh, really don't necessarily generate much controversy, and they're more perfunctory than anything else. And the first to start with the approval of the pr minutes from the previous meeting. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? No. I'm going to abstain. Yeah. You have an abstention? Abstain. Okay. Councilor, no. Councilor Freeman Daniels is abstaining for the record. Uh, reports on committee's appointments and elections. Um, Take them as a group. Uh, there's a motion to accept them as a group. Is there a second? I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Uh, next, we have a reappointment to the Conservation Commission. Uh, Mason Maroon is here uh, he, uh, from 18 Ellington Road in Florence, and the term starts uh, from uh, March 2013 to March 2016. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second it. Um, Sus uh, suspend rule 13, 40, 30, 27. It's rule 30. Thing. Thank, Thank you. you. There's What's a motion to suspend the rule, I'll second rule that. 30. What's the actual to not refer to, not refer. to committee. To All those in favor of the motion to suspend the non referral? Aye. 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 Opposed? And if you <laughs> abstain, I'm coming across the table. I'm going to come. <laughs> Councilor, uh, uh, in the motion to accept the nomination is also made it on the floor? Is yes, it is. Clear yep. on that? Okay. Yes. And Councilor Specter. Yeah, um, this is a reappointment, and as usual with a reappointment, we check to make sure that the person who's being reappointed has, is a member in good standing. I found out he's very, a, a very good standing on this particular committee, uh, this commission, which is the Conservation Commission. So that is why we're moving it forward without referring it back to committee for the candidate to be re-interviewed. Councilor Thank you. Um, I have known Mason for a long, long time on conservation and I have actually gone on site with him in conservation several years ago on my ward, and he's very, very dedicated, and um, there's no question about suspending this rule. He's excellent, very dedicated, and very knowledgeable. <laughs> any, any other comments? Councilor Spector. Um, I think, am I wrong on this, but are, it, it, has Mason served longer? Mason, have you been serving for like 30 years? 30 years. Yeah, I think he holds the record. I believe he does. I will check with the 37 years. Let the record show that Mason. So I'd like to congratulate. 30, this is his 37th year. 37 years. I believe that's the longest serving. I, I spoke to uh, Lynn in the mayor's office, and we're going to find out. And I think that will deserve special recognition. Oh. Well, there you go. And it, whether it deserves special recognition or a special <coughs> prescription, <laughs> uh, Mason, thank you very much for your service, and we're now going to vote on your uh, nomination. All those in favor of approving C. Mason Maroon for uh, a, a, another term on the Conservation Commission, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? <clears throat> thank you, and thanks for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next up is a reappointment to, to the Housing Authority, Ron Heber, to 49 Old South Street, Apartment 701, near Northampton, for a term starting March 2013 and expiring March 2018. So moved. Second it. Second. And suspend Rule 30. Second it. Okay. All those in favor of suspending Rule 30, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now on to the motion, on to the candidate. And again, same, same thing that... Uh, Mr. Herbert has been uh, a member in good standing on this on the Housing Authority. 
and uh, therefore we were moving forward without the uh, usual referral to committee uh, <coughs> on a reappointment. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions. Now this is a, also a new appointment to the, this is a new appointment <coughs> to the Housing Authority. Lynn Wallace at 110 Cardinal Way in Florence. Term beginning March 2013 and expiring 2018 to replace Iris Rosa. Is there a motion? Move referral to appointments and evaluations. Second. There's a motion to refer to appointments and valuations. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's referred. Uh, now, an appointment to the Community Preservation <coughs> Committee is Recreation Commission <coughs> Representative. Glenn Connolly, 49 Platinum Circle in Florence, term to expire June 2015. Uh, the, rec uh, the Recreation Commission voted June 3rd, 2013 to so refer to appointments and evaluations. Uh, second. But is there, this is already coming. Oh. Su su suspend Rule 30. Uh, wait, wait. Well, okay, hang on a second. There's oh, a motion right. to, a motion to approve. It should be a motion to approve. Yes. Okay, well, you want to change that to a motion to approve? Yes. And that's your second, second. motion to yes. approve. Then suspend the rule. Yeah. And now is there a call for a suspension of rule? Yes. Suspend rule 30. And second it. And the second. Okay. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 And opposed? And abstentions? Mm -hmm. Okay. And now? Now, speaking to the appointment, our policy has been with appointments that are in the purview of the, of the of a committee or a commission to the Community Preservation Act that we don't then interview that candidate. We basically have decided to trust the committee or commission that their appointment would stand and that we would not then interview that particular committee in our committee. If someone here has an objection to that appointment, they should bring it up to the whole council. That has been our policy. Councilor Freeman Davis. Yeah, I concur. I mean, we're expecting the Recreation Commission to elect someone that uh, they believe will adequately represent them on the CPC. So uh, I don't think it's really within the subcommittee's job to determine their, um, their or the committee's job to uh, determine their uh, eligibility in that regard. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the nomination, please say aye. <coughs> aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Um, well, now we would move on to a recess for finance committee, but we're missing a finance committee member. What's, what do you think we should do here? We, can, we have other items that we can take off Let's here. Keep Let's keep going. Okay, see. we'll keep going. See if he makes it. Roll. What's that? We're on a roll. Uh, why don't we start out of order uh, to the ordinances that are set for referral. That's 17 through 21. I can... Don't worry, I'll wait for you to catch up. This is the back page. Back page, thank you. 17 through 21. 17 through 21. Uh, one is attachment use in dimensional regulations for central dis uh, business district. The other is increase the height limits in general business district. The other is to adopt council committee, uh, council committees. Uh, the other is to change to city council rules number two and 43. And then also amend 22.2 through 22.8 on the council committees. So moved. Second it. And moved as a group. It's moved so as a group. To refer them. Now they're, they're recommended to refer to uh, Edlu and uh, ordinance for. Okay. Not all. Can we separate? Can we separate these out? I think we need yeah, to back up. up. All right. Okay. 17 and 18. The referral recommendation is for Edlu and and ordinance. Yes. And planning board. I move those two as and a planning board. board. Okay, uh, so those are all moved as a group. Are they? Where, did they come from planning board? No, it says planning board. Right oh, I see. Okay. Uh, so <coughs> different. Um, I believe these were submitted by the planning board, but whenever we're doing zoning, we have to refer we'll back refer to back. planning. Okay. okay, so the motion is to refer 17 and 18 to the referred. Committees, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? On to 1920 and 21, the referral is recommendations for uh, all four ordinances. Yes. I move to refer to Committee on Election Rules, Ordinance, and Orders, um, number 1920 and 21. Second. There's a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 
extensions. Uh, still no sign of. Is there anything else we can remember? We also have under ordinances. We can we have uh, recommendations from the city solicitor, and those are four through twelve. Wait a minute. I'm waiting four through twelve. So if you go further under the next page, so they start number four starts on page three, and then they go into uh, page four, and that's the amendment <coughs> is. So I think it. I uh, Mr. President, I think it's seven. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Seven through twelve. Yeah. No. No. Sorry. Yeah. No. I'm sorry. I double marked these. I'm sorry. Seven through twelve are the ones. The city solicitor recommendations of the overview of the city council uh, and city council committee. Yeah. These are all in first readings. Uh, also amend. Oh right. <clears throat> yes. So they. Right. These are in first reading. These are all in first reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. You want to take them separately? Yes. 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 I'll accept a motion for the first one. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Um, discussion. The first. Can we, the first can one we hear the is is the overview of city council and city council. Can, can, since this is first reading, can we actually? Could you actually read it? Yes. Sorry. We, I think we have a little bit of time. Mary, we're, 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 catching, we're, we're catching up with. Okay. <clears throat> um, you want you want to hear this? Yeah, the solicitor's one. memorandum too. Um, That's on the basis. Well, I'll read, read the order first. The order the the ordinance. Ordinance. It's an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 22.1 of said code providing that overview of city council and city council committees be ordained by the city council of the city of northampton and city council assembled as follows as section 221 of the code of ordinances of the city of northampton massachusetts shall be amended so that such section shall read as follows 221 overview of city council and city council committees establishment of committees what what, what is the relevant active element the strikes i think <coughs> um. Mr. President, <coughs> you, I wonder if uh, somebody could summarize, like a I'm, lawyer here, who might summarize oh, the meat of this I'm, for or us. The chair, yeah, like, yeah, I'm chair. happy to. The chair. Yeah. Well, I, I can read the memo from the city yeah. solicitor. That will like, cover it. Like okay. Yeah, that should, and then mm -hmm. we had discussions at ordinance. So okay. Okay. okay, thank you. I, I'm proposing this committee sponsor revision, <coughs> so, and this is from uh, Alan Seawalt, the city solicitor. I am proposing this committee sponsor revisions to the code of ordinances in order to eliminate the process by which the committee handles certain claims, uh, currently claims for defects in public ways known as Chapter 84 claims are handled by this committee, claims against the city for general negligence and other wrongful acts known as Chapter 258 claims are sent directly to the city's insurance company for handling. My proposal is to eliminate this committee's role in determining whether to pay Chapter 84 claims and to allow both categories of claims to be sent directly to the city's insurers. My reasons for this proposal are twofold. First, both Chapter uh, 84 claims and Chapter 258 claims have uh, very specific, although uh, different, notice requirements with which a claimant must comply before a claim may be made. Our current system for handling Chapter 84 <coughs> claims does not follow state law in this regard, and claims are being paid without statutory compliance. The city's insurer is set up to receive, evaluate, and determine whether the claimant has followed a proper procedure and whether the claim is one that should be paid. Second, the current system is inefficient and burdensome on staff and on the city solicitor and on members of this committee. My proposal would require that upon receipt of the claim, staff collect much of the same information now collected, i.e. any records of notice of a defect in the way. And send the claim and such supporting documents to the insurer. Unless the insurer contacts staff for more information, the involvement of the city staff would then be concluded, and this process has the benefits of not placing staff, the city solicitor, and the council so comprise the committee in an adversarial position vis a vis the citizens versus claimants, and, and of reducing the billable time spent by the solicitor. I've spoken with the uh, council for the nearby cities and towns, and this is the way each of them handle such claims. And attached here to, in red line, strikeout format are the ordinances that would need to be amended 
or repealed in order to carry out this proposal in reviewing the charge of the committee. I did not find any duties with regard to elections, so I've eliminated that reference from the committee's name as well. And Council Murphy, you want to expand on that? Or <clears throat> Oh, abs absolutely. Um, it basically would remove the claims process from <coughs> the Ordinance and Claims Committee and turn it over to professional staff. Um, the other thought as we're going through this with, is re with regards to the separation of our activities and powers. <clears throat> this is an administrative function, not a legislative function. Um, so it would be handled by, you know, essentially the member of the public would either file a claim with the city clerk or the mayor's office, it would be forwarded to council, it would be forwarded to our insurance company and dealt with that way rather than coming here to the, to the city council committee. Thanks. Because it's an administrative <laughs> function. And this is something that came up in our review of all of the committees and what they're doing, moving them from ordinance over to council rules. And I know Councilor Adams recommendations for some of the other committees coming into council rules. So it's kind of a separation of powers housekeeping. <clears throat> oh, right. um, <clears throat> during our discussion with the solicitor he also told us that and it's explained in here but w chapter 84 has, has a different notice requirement from chapter 258 and chapter 258 requirements are two years the chapter 84 are 30 days we've been treating them similarly but um but it, it's possible that in the past sometimes our claims have not been in compliance with with uh, with these notice requirements, which would put us out of compliance with state law, um, and which would also make us susceptible to challenges from people who uh, who have who whose claims were denied by by the committee, and also any taxpayer who's who, who would want to sue in a situation where we allowed a claim that, um, but we where we would have allowed a claim even though it wasn't pursuant to the correct notice, and also um, as 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 was stated. I was I it was I met it with skepticism at first because I I, I felt that it was beneficial for the citizens to to be able to come and appeal to the to the to the committee, but um, we are unique in our, our our setup, and they don't lose a right to appeal. They would have to take it to the court to appeal, and in some ways the courts might be more more neutral than than three elected officials. So that that's really what made me think that that's probably the, the best for for the citizens. Um, so that's why I'm supporting this. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And likewise, um, initially when we received this uh, uh, proposed ordinance change at our, at our committee, um, we were uh, quite confused. We, didn't, we needed to have uh, the solicitor explain the reasoning behind this, and he did uh, describe his conversations with uh, surrounding towns and their process. And also, I think what, what was better clarified for me then was the uh, description of the administrative function. It does seem to fall more in line with an administrative function than a legislative, since we've gone through this clarification in our charter change. My only reservation then remained is um, what kind of appeal might citizens have um, in the sense that we do still, even as a legislative body here appeals from uh, license grantees so those that are denied when I think that our public safety committee serves as that body to hear the appeals when they've been I think the most recent we heard was a taxi license that was denied by the police department but then came to the public safety committee so I guess the question remains whether similar functions would exist in other committees um, or to be consistent with this act, um, or if we think about whether we should have any uh, role in some some appeal, as was mentioned by the city solicitor, a person at this point, if they're denied by the insurance city's insurer, would then have the opportunity to go to court. Um, at any rate, this is a big change. I don't want to uh, minimize it, downplay it, because the ordinance committee has listened to claims about mailboxes and potholes and. Uh, falling street lamps and things like that for uh, for many other councillors who served on that committee. I know that that's the lion's share of that committee's work, in fact. Um, so it is a it is a big uh, change to take the claims process out of the committee. Uh, also, the other thing is, too, that it, it does save resources to an extent because when the solicitor comes, for example, last meeting, we, the first 35, 40 minutes of he, what he sat through were the claims. And so, of course, he's on the clock when he does that. 
Um, so it does use resources in that sense. It also uses quite a bit of the council clerk's resources dealing with them. So that would be saved too. I um I am rather uh, skeptical about this change, um, mostly because I uh, I don't believe that the um, the city adequately is able uh, the city is adequately able to record notice uh, when notice is made and so on. Um, I uh, I think that. Um, this will result in um, much more denials than should be because the city's um, the, the uh, knowledge that the councilors have regarding um, the workings of various departments will not be uh, carried over to our to the city's insurer, um, and so uh, and because of the um, sometimes a faulty or spotty administration of notice. Uh, and of work orders, I think that uh, this is going to be, um, this will be difficult for many, many residents. Uh, I also don't agree that um, uh, this wouldn't be a purview, this wouldn't be something in the purview of the council. Um, there is a, a real distinction between an executive power and the powers of the council, but um, administrative powers are not the same as executive ones. And I'm, I've got the charter in front of me right here, and it actually gives the council all powers re relating to the city. I'll just read it, except as otherwise provided by general law or by this charter, all powers of the city shall be vested in the city council. Uh, and it goes on, it says, and sh which shall provide for their exercise and for the performance of all duties and obligations opposed, imposed upon the city by law. Now, later on in the charter, it does say that the mayor is the executive, um, but uh, I don't believe that uh, that means that the council cannot perform some administrative functions. Um, but I do think that uh, there will be some method of appeal, which was very important to me. And um, I'm also uh, in favor of uh, uh, saving resources and, and legal fees. So, um, so I'm torn because I, I don't think that the city adequately records uh, problem areas that uh, that end up arising in claims but uh, I do think that uh, ultimately this is the way we want to go thank you I do agree with the councillors read that we have the right to uh, continue as we're doing <clears throat> however I do think that with the appeal process I think hopefully we would be as a city and continue to be um, savvy enough that if we look at a case and we think that person has a a good case that we wouldn't we wouldn't fight that in appeal but would come to some kind of resolution um, and so I think that we're overlooking that in that process there's a, also a process when somebody does file an appeal and may take us to whatever that appeal process is that people are going to look at this and um, and come to the conclusion that yeah this this is a good case we shouldn't fight this one and we may fight others also having been at times at the ordinance committee through the years I've been on this com committee and have gone I've often thought I don't really want to be one of the people sitting there on the claims piece and I, I admire you guys who can because I feel like I'm often too emotional about it and uh, sometimes we have counselors who are not as well trained at kind of looking objectively and I think I was one of those I'd be more inclined to serve if I am on the council another term to be on ordinance because that was one of the things I just I just didn't feel like I wanted to be or, or felt like I could be um, part of so there was just something about doing that claims piece that uh, I don't know if you serving on ordinance you seem to handle it well but uh, and I admire you for it but uh, I'm glad it's not going to be in the hands of ordinance if we were to pass this <coughs> other comments uh, Council just comments. one other I mean the, um, again the only thing that I'm concerned with is somehow retaining some aspect of appeal, allowing this to go through the insurance um, agent as recommended, <coughs> uh, and maybe uh, to, for those people who aren't happy with the finding from the insurance company and can make a very strong case. I mean, I don't know if that puts us in the same position as we were in that 
every uh, every claim that's denied will just come right back to us. But um, I like the idea of having some avenue of appeal for residents. I don't know how to how to work that in, and maybe that's just another step when we redefine the committees or when we uh, go through that process later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just have a question for Council Adams. With regards to appeal, I know it, it was appealing to me the thought that a claimant could go to the court, which is more impartial, because essentially they're ask they're appealing to elected officials of the city that they're making the claim against, which seemed <coughs> a little unusual to me. So now it would go to a third party. But for the smaller claims, could they go to small claims rather than actually have to go through the court? Yes. Probably, yeah. So they yeah, depending on amounts, but but the, but I, there's a filing fee, and that's there is a filing fee. There's a filing fee, uh, but for, it, it is a it's more the people's court. You can speak your piece in small claims yourself to the magistrate, correct? So you don't have to. Right. I mean, no. Well, sometimes people are represented by lawyers, but mostly it's it's usually just citizens stating their case. Stating their case. So they for and most of our claims are are not that large. You know, they would fall under small claims, would they not? Yeah, most of them, mo okay. the vast majority certainly would. would. Fall under small claims, so they wouldn't need counsel, and they could just file a, an application for for small claims and right. go to the magistrate and speak their piece. And right. Okay. Thank you. The concern that I have is that just that point that there for the citizens in Northampton, they've enjoyed a free access without associated costs and appeal to their elected officials regarding the issue that they hold the invariably hold the officials somewhat culpable in some level. And what that and I think this speaks to what Council Freeman Daniels was saying that that um, it, it, it it may not be efficient, but it is it is I, I'm always having a concern to create more and more insulation between us and the contact with the citizens, particularly with issues that um, inspire frustration or some distress, because I mean that's what we signed up for. I think a principal job of a counselor is essentially to be the firewall of sorts, the place that takes the most heat, as or roundup, depending on what you're looking at. <laughs> and um, so, I, I'm not going to object to these, but that is my concern: is that that till now up to date or until and unless these become enacted the citizens have always had the right to come free of charge at an appointed time and make their case for their claim and that will now suddenly be moved into a more impartial perhaps uh, bureaucracy and a court system that has associated costs and fees with it and going up against a far less responsive insurance company now I mean I don't know. We're never going to pretend that insurance companies <laughs> are our best. You know the oh well. There, there's some thoughtful people who understand my plight. <laughs> they these are people who who look at uh, actuarial tables and these are people who analyze maps and rarely or photographs and rarely visit the site. Know the people involved with the circumstances. So it it uh, it's, it, it makes sense. I actually think more to the point would the solicitor is suggesting is one that we are not in statutory compliance and that's not good and also the fact that the associated costs given the discussions that we're having that we'll have later tonight and going forward that it makes sense that this I mean this is a particularly large expense for very little product basically as it were so it's not particularly efficient yes, can, uh, <coughs> Councilor Adams just a legal question on this if someone were to appeal, is it the insurance company who would then be the ones who would foot the bill, the legal bill on the other side, so they would be deciding if someone appeals it, is this worth it to us as an insurance company to fight this particular claim in court, or the city would then be independent and the city then? I'm not. I'm, I'm, the I'm not sure if you're if you're asking. Well, it, well, for one, there's if the insurance company denies a claim. We could. We Do can they then go after the insurance? Does the insurance company then have to take on that expense and case in the appeal process? I, I believe so, but um, but also there there are the, um, they could be yeah yeah, yeah the, the answer I believe yes the answer is I believe yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels. I think 
I think what we're hearing is that the, the appeal process, I believe the appeal process that, that this would uh, allow for is the same appeal process that the current system allows for. If the, if the current ordinance committee denies a claim, the uh, resident is still entitled to appeal and, and settle it in the courts, yeah. and the, insurance comp our, the city's insurer is still obligated to defend us. It's the same. Okay. Yes. It's the same appeal. Mm -hmm. It's just that instead of being reviewed by a three-member body <coughs> that is more familiar with the city's mm -hmm. organizational structure and, and communication schemes, it's revealed by a, um, a guy with a rubber stamp or a woman with a rubber stamp at the insurance company. Uh, Councilman Murphy. Yeah. Um, as far as our application of hearing these claims, many, the vast majority of our claims are with regards to public ways. Uh, I hit a pothole. Um, I tripped on a this or that uh, in a public way. And we, we are not an insurance company. We are liable for something, a defect, let's say, on which we had reasonable notice that we then subsequently failed to repair. So if you're the first person to hit a pothole and it hadn't yet been reported, we can't help you because we did not have notice of the defect and did not have a reasonable time to effect a repair. If you hit it three days later and we have no, had notice of it and we didn't fix it and we're negligent fixing it, then we do feel we have some liability under state statute, then we're liable to deal with it. Um, many of the people do get insurance coverage on some of these because the insurance company covers them for the unknown things that may come up, like hitting a pothole. But with us, we have to have had prior notice. So with all of our claims, the claim is collected, sent to Public Works, and they check their work order to see if they had notice. So if you're the first person or maybe even the second one and we didn't have a day or so to fix it, we're not in a position to help you because we didn't have notice. So I, I think at least it's been my experience with the vast number of the claims that we deal with, the function is more reviewing the report from DPW on notice and then determining was that sufficient time. And that's something that clearly could be done by an insurance company because if we didn't have notice, we can't, we can't pay the claim. And we've had those appear as potholes. We've had them appear as um, somebody slipping on a, on a defect that we didn't have, were aware of. And the strangest one was the last one where a, a light fixture fell off a light pole and landed on somebody's hood. Um, but we had no advance notice of any defect in the light fixture. So their insurance company would cover them for an un you know, for an unforeseen activity, but without notice, you know, I guess in that regard, our function is primarily educational to explain to the person that we can't pay your claim because without prior notice of the defect, without having been afforded an opportunity to correct it, we can't compensate you. So we do spend a, a lot of time collecting DPW reports and then we explain to people, you know, shucks, we can't help you because in your circumstance, we did not have advance notice of the defect Therefore, we didn't have time to adequately effect a repair, so we can't help you. And we do that over and over and over again mm -hmm. in, the, in the process. Uh, uh, yeah, and also along those same lines, but on the other end, one of the, you know, the regular claims that we receive are the mailbox claims, for which we've actually enacted a procedure, because typically um, if we do hit a mailbox in the process of plowing the road, um, and that mailbox is not, you know, in some way, you know, right out in the middle of the street or something where we couldn't have not hit it. Um, we do have a process whereby folks can have their mailbox replaced. However, we do that with a lot of warnings, letting people know that they don't own that portion of the street that belongs to the city. Um, and so therefore they shouldn't have a, you know, a $1,000 mailbox put it right out on the street that's in a very dangerous spot when we have to plow the road. So um, I'm, I'm assuming that something similar would be in effect uh, if we were to change this over, that there would be a process whereby someone who lost their mailbox due to a, a snowstorm plowing event um, 
they'd be able to get the, is it $50? $50. $50 is what we had as a standard. They get a voucher. And the, and the poor mailboxes is really a catch-22 for the public because the Postal Service says put it right out at the curb, but that's usually city property. So, you know, at what point, you know, somebody puts their mailbox on city property, well, that's where we, the city puts the snow from the city streets. So it's kind of a catch-22. They put them out there, and in the normal course of plowing snow, we put snow in the city right away, and their mailbox is there. So uh, that, that's, a real, that's a real tough one. But we've had, what, $600, people claiming $600 mailbox. <laughs> Um, multiple they times the they, you know, they don't catch on the, the first time it gets wrong. and they don't get wrong they just get squished by snow I mean heavy snow will take them right out um, actually the motion was on the first one and I've allowed debate on all of them given the, given the memo from the solicitor um, do, is there an interest in, in changing the motion to include all of the uh, solicitor's ordinance or would you still want to take this one they, ver they really are interrelated because they, they, they deal with moving the ordinance function. That's the first one. But then they also take out the term elections. They basically leave it um, as, the, as just the ordinances, the ordinances and rules, so ordinances and rules because question. we don't do elections and we would take out the claim. So they, they, it just all accomplishes so, that. So that's process. 7, 8, 9, and 10. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that oh, no, I'm sorry. It's, it's one, uh, 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 seven, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Wait, am I on the right place? There you go. Seven through twelve. So, uh, control officer. Councilor Freeman Dean. Okay. Um, I'll make that. Uh, okay. I, I see. Amendment, uh, or ask if the whoever made the original motion would accept it as a friendly. Well, I don't know who made the original <laughs> motion. <laughs> we didn't have a motion. We we uh -huh. took them separate. Yeah, we took it separate. We started. We well, how about this? Just for cleaning up, I'll accept the motion, and let's all assume that yours is a motion to accept them as a group. And is there a second for that? Second it. Okay. Now the discussion. Councilor Freeman Daniels, you had some comments. In. Yeah, I just um, <clears throat> what I said, but what I said before, I just I, I don't want to I don't want to revisit it. But I I just do have <coughs> concerns going forward with this, due to the I believe the faulty notice that the city uh, often collects. I don't think the reports from um, our city departments are always accurate. And uh, I think that um, we have uh, <coughs> local representatives who understand much better the workings of our city departments. You're going to have much more um, a judgment being exercised than you do with uh, an insurance company. But. Um, you know, I'm 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 willing to try this, understanding that uh, we can go back uh, if it if there's if there's a, a real problem. And I, I think yeah. there I don't know if there will be a real problem, but I do think that this is really going to uh, restrict the, uh, um, the the um, relief that uh, citizens get from the city, um, but. Uh, as long as it's possible to go back, which I do believe it is, then I, I'm, I'm willing to vote aye to save some money and to save some time. Uh, but, Carney, yeah. but just along those same lines, um, I'm also concerned a, a little bit about the process of notice. It might be helpful, and I wonder if uh, folks would be willing to hear, since uh, the chief is, is here, if we could ask um, or if we could recognize Ned Huntley? Sure, I'll make that motion. There's a motion a quick question about it's a motion to recognize Ned. Are you, how are you feeling, Ned? <laughs> I, and and, and the, I, the reason I um, ask this, uh, I don't know if you need to have a motion to recognize. Uh, there was a motion and it was second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 I'm okay. the director of the um, DPW. Yes, your question again? Well, the question is, typically we receive um, information that a, a, a recommendation for a claim should be denied or approved based on whether the city had prior notice. And it seems to me that that's based on whether in the record there's a work order. And so that's what raised some confusion sometimes because um, a, a notice may have been received or someone may have made a call and made a report, but, but 
uh, we don't necessarily know that that has then been communicated to whatever process is involved to create a work order. So reliance on a work order in order to uh, justify whether or not the city has received notice seems a little bit tenuous, and that's one of the reasons I recently uh, voted, I think, to um, approve a claim that had been recommended to be denied. So I I'm just wondering if you could just clarify a little bit about that process. Sure. We, um, the cl predominantly, the clerks at the office take the calls in from the citizens, or we have walk-in requests, or I see something on the roadway hazard, I'll put in a work order request or a service order request, as we call it. They range anything from tree issues to potholes to missing signs on streets to dead animals in the road. So we, anything that comes in is logged into the work order system if it's requiring the crews to do something. A lot of times issues can be resolved on the phone without developing a work order, but as far as uh, hazards in the street layout, they're always recorded in a work order system. And the other thing is, since net we now have this app yes. uh, that the city uses? Yes, see click fix. Right. Is that something then that would a, a citizen could expect then that there would be a record because they pressed click when they saw it or they know someone? There is a record. It's generated. And in the past few claims that I responded to, predominantly on potholes, I've appended those to the claim, mm -hmm. the actual work order from see click fix. So and those, you can, those you can track the repair yeah. and, the, and, the, and the history of the, or is That's the right. app, right. app yeah. that you can get on your yeah. smartphone, that it's available to every citizen for free. It's, uh, you and can look for it under Commonwealth Connect. It's also see quick fix. I heard Facebook wanted to buy that for a billion. <laughs> there, there you go. It's the, but it is, it is an app that allows citizens to actually use their smartphones to photograph a, a hazard and send it to, and with, with uh, GPS coding that will notify the Department of Public Works of a hazard. And my question is, does it automatically generate a work order? If, if we're relying on work orders as the evidence of whether or not we've received notice, we, does we that? We currently have three systems at the DPW. We're trying to phase out the old access database system, which used to generate all the work orders. C Click Fix now is currently used for only potholes. Each uh, department had one selection to use to try it out. What we're working on right now is integrating it, integrating it with ViewWorks. ViewWorks is our GIS-driven uh, service order center, which also integrates and actually can move service requests to a work order. It also will flag if we have multiple requests on a certain pothole or a certain issue, we don't keep generating work order after work order for the same thing. Right. This is one of the problems we see with C Click Fix and our old system, there is no flag that Oh, Mrs. Jones has already called five times on this issue in the past two weeks, and ViewWorks does that. Uh, Council Murphy. I just have a question for Councilor Adams. With regards to the, the way we conflict with the statute relative to notice, I, I for some reason think we're talking about two kinds of notice. We've just been talking to Mr. Huntley about notice of the defect and the time in which to repair it, but the statute's referring to the, the claimant to notifying the city initially about it, right. correct? So the That's statutory right. conflict isn't with, did Mr. Huntley have notice to fix it? It's that when did, when did the aggrieved individual notice the city that they That's had a right. claim, correct? Right. So it's two different, yeah. two All different right. notices. Two. I have a suggestion. Um, I, don't, I mean, it's an idea. I don't know. But here's the idea. One of the things we can do is we can have it go through, you know, have claims go through the insurer. And the appeal process can be to come to this council mm -hmm. before it goes to the courts. That's, I mean, that puts us in this, some of the same positions that that we're trying to avoid because I'll again use Mary's time and, and Alan's time, but um, but that puts us in a similar position. I mean, but, but that that's an idea if counselors are, are uncomfortable with it substantially. I, I'm relatively comfortable with it, even though I hear some really good points and concerns. But that's an idea. Uh, Councilor Freeman Dane. Thank you. I, um, like I said, I, I think uh, I think it's worth a try, uh, and uh, I also think that we should have some, you know, a, an appeal process that's prior to the court system. But clearly, you don't want it to get abused, right? If 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 everybody knows that ev that you yeah. that the first step is get denied at the insurance mm -hmm. company, then the second step is whatever. Then then that's it's going to be it's going to be the same 
system, basically. So um, it, it could be that, uh, you know, we could throw out a, another idea, which is that the chair of, of ordinance um, can decide on, he on whether to mm -hmm. hear an appeal before or, or not before it, before the court to remedy uh, or, or what have you. You know, there are many options, but um, we don't have those in front of us, and it would take kind of a lot of work to amend it. Um, I do know that ordinance, that all the city council committees are going to be are work, are being rewritten, so it's possible that in the next few months we could dredge up some other appeal. But like I said, uh, I'm, I'm torn on this, but I'm, I'm willing to vote aye to, uh, to, to save some money and, and some time. Council Murphy, then Council Spector. And I, I, having chaired ordinance this last time around, I'd love to give this new process a try to see if it's effective and if it works. And the reason it's coming up before the other council rule changes are is because this has an impact on the mayor's budget, you know, because we, we can budget less solicitor time and budget less for, for mm -hmm. claims payouts because it will be an insurance function. So it's got an economic reason why it's coming up now. Um, so I'd, I'd, I would, my recommendation would be to give it a try to see if it's effective. If it's not, we can certainly uh, revisit it. But if we're, if we're going to do it, it would be good to either do two readings on it tonight or do it on the 27th, do the second reading quickly on the 27th so that a change would be in place for the new fiscal year so that we'd recognize the financial advantages of doing it. Councilor Specter and Councilor Act. Yeah, I was just going to ask the members of the committee if they thought it was a good idea. The Council Freeman Daniels idea of giving it a chance because it sounds good to me and so I would just go along with it as well that we should try it I, I th yeah I, I, I agree that we should give it a chance and also if we did decide to go back the language is all there because we've done it this way for so long anyhow I don't think it'd be that burdensome uh, any other discussion on these as a group being moved in first reading yeah, I'd like, I mean, we haven't had, we, the, the public has not had a chance to comment on this. I wouldn't like to do two readings today. Uh, if it could be on the 27th. That would be, that would be the, schedule, the next scheduled meeting would be the 27th. So. 27th of June. Oh, June, yes. that's the special meeting. Uh, that's right. Uh, Council LaVarge. Yes, and I have to agree with Owen Freeman Daniels. I feel that one reading is adequate enough and to give the public enough of time to really look at this language very very carefully and I do agree um, definitely about let's give it a try let's see how it works out if not then we bring it to ordinance and see what we can do with the language any other discussion all this in favor roll call oh, I'm sorry this is a roll call on this uh, and these are all in toto uh, items 7 through 12 Yes. 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 Aye. Press, oh, yes. 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 Okay. Um, uh, for the public, we've actually convened at six o'clock, but we're still going to have the public session at seven. So don't despair. Uh, please sign up if you're interested in speaking. Um, we're still conducting the perfunctory business so that because we have a big schedule ahead of us tonight, so that's the reason for originally convening at 6 o'clock. Um, we are still absent. The Finance Committee member, uh, I, we, have a, we have a quorum, so, and if we can, if we can just, if ever, Well, all those I'd like to suggest will be taken a recess. Up again. They'll be taken up again uh, at the regular meeting. Yeah. How about that? Want to do the Round Hill parking ordinances? Yeah. Yes. Those yes. are items four through six. Um, except uh, Councilor Specter would Councilor like Specter to speak to those. He's oh, just sitting next to Chad. Oh, he's here. Okay. He's, he's here somewhere. He's here somewhere. Well, ah, he, Councilor took a recess. Um, I move. Uh, Ordinance is um, four through six. Second. There's a motion, four through six. These are ordinances. This is the first reading for uh, parking prohibitions on Round Hill Road, and then no parking at certain times and limited time parking on Round Hill Road. Uh, 
second? Did I get second? Did you get second? Uh, yeah. Do you need to read any portion of those? For the um, I can if you like. Please do. Yes. At least I'll the first one. You may be interested in this. I am. And actually, you might want to speak to it. Maybe the. I think you should. You interested? Do you know what we're up around to here? I think you're around Hill Road. Around Hill Road, the yeah. parking restrictions and, and yes. time limitations. Do you want to speak to those? Yeah. Um, so it's already been moved. Second. Moved and yeah. second. It's on the floor. So this is uh, this went to transportation and parking, where I believe it it had all the votes except one. It also was a fairly non-controversial item. It's from the this essentially is going to be no parking from the very top of Round Hill Road, where currently the Clark School Administration Building is. Go from the top of Round Hill Road down to Elm Street. Um, this has been at times a concern of residents even before the changes to Clark School where there's going to be a good deal more traffic of the narrowness of the road there. And so uh, currently the change is going to be there is an there it's written in three ways here because there's currently a one hour parking piece which is one of the ordinances that needs to be changed to no parking at any time. So currently at the very top of the hill there are a few spaces that are one hour parking. Then as you go down the hill on the northern side, I believe it's the northern side, there is currently no overnight parking. Um, and so those two areas, those two ordinates covered no parking on that side of the street. And then there on the opposite side of the street, it will be also no parking at any time. So again, rarely have I gone to a neighborhood where there has been I, I don't believe there was any opposition to making this change. There might be somebody listening now, but essentially we had two meetings about this with the neighborhood and with Laura Hansen when she was with DPW and with Carolyn Mish, and it was pretty much consensus. The reason we're not bringing all of Round Hill Road where there are going to be more changes later is from the top of the hill, same place, Clark School Administration Building, in the other direction down to the Crescent Street area. Okay. There is differences of opinion, and so therefore we decided to bring forward the one that was not very controversial. We we're going to bring forward other ordinances that deal, and there may be changes, there may not be, because of the overall changes in the area with the development that's going on there now. So we're going to bring forward in the future the more controversial elements, which we can't seem to reach consensus on. Any further discussion? <coughs> Uh, yeah, this was brought to the Transportation Parking Commission. Uh, it was um, broadly accepted, um, broadly recommended, rather. Um, the uh, narrowness of the street is a significant concern. And um, the, other, the other issue that was brought up, and I hope that you're working on this a little bit, Councilor Spector, is the expense of installing uh, park, no parking signs is uh, roughly over $2,500. So we're wondering if you can twist Opal's arm a little bit to get uh, to get the city to get a little bit of funds to actually pay for those signs. Um, they, w they will be benefiting significantly from those no parking during the construction. They'll be able to get uh, wide uh, vehicles up the, up the street. So uh, I support this. Any other discussion? <coughs> Councilor Casey, uh, we're on items <coughs> four through seven. Uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, four through six. This is, uh, and I believe you already heard this in parking. This is limited time parking, no parking certain times, and parking prohibitions on round This is not Here. to include ordinance three, which is the not to include ordinance of three. That's to the historic district. Yeah, meeting that. that. So, any further discussion on these? All right, this is a ordinance first reading. Roll call, please. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Carney Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Passed. All right, we have now 656. We can recess for five minutes, and during that time, I would recommend anyone who's interested in speaking at 7 uh, for public comment to sign up at the sign-up sheet at the podium, and then we'll convene um, at 7 o'clock the rest of the meeting, uh, where we'll be taking up the city budget, among other things, as well as three resolutions and, sorry, and three public hearings. So that public hearings come after 
public comment. So we will yeah. recess until 7 o'clock. <laughs>Good evening. We're uh, reconvening uh, the Northampton City Council meeting of June 20th, 2013. Uh, I'm City Council President Bill Dwight. Uh, we are now in our second hour of this session. Uh, we will open with public comment. And uh, actually, can someone hand me the sheet, the sign up sheet there? <laughs> I'm worried, about the I'm worried about the separation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just I man, the end I suppose. It's a, um, the, on public comment, for those of you this is, this is new, we um, the city council allows the public to speak for three minutes at a time on any topic of their choosing, asking that you uh, maintain a sense of decorum. Uh, there's a timer here that will start as soon as you announce your name and address, which we ask you to do when you uh, do step up to speak. And um, the only caveat is that should you feel inclined or entitled to run over the three minutes, I will um, ask you to stop. If you refuse, if you ruled out of order, we'll go into recess until you clear the chambers. Um, and with that, we will start. Steve Gilson. Good evening. My name is Stephen Gilson. I live at 235 Maple Ridge Road, and I'm here to speak in favor of the zoning proposals for changes to URA, B, and C. Um, I was a member of the Zoning Revisions Committee. In fact, I was the original chair of the Zoning Revisions Committee. I was a member of the Planning Board during the four years, I believe, we've been looking at this, and I was the chair of the Planning Board for three of those four years. Um, the ZRC spent about two years looking at these, doing public outreach, holding public forums. They then took their recommendations and passed them on to the planning board. The planning board spent 18 months looking at these, having their own public forums, adding their input. The planning board then recommended to the city council and through the US zoning and ordinance subcommittee, the city council has had their chance to have public forums. The city council has made changes to these. So there's been a lot of process involved over the last for it might even be five years it's been a long time um, so what the ZRC did uh, we originally started looking at uh, what the neighborhoods are today and one of the things we looked at for example if you live in URA B or C right now a third of those houses are non-conforming if you live in UR, uh, sorry if you live in a two-family house in URA B or C there's a 90 percent chance it's non-conforming in fact if you live in a two-family house in URA it's a hundred percent non-conforming so what we were trying to do was find a way to get these existing houses in these existing neighborhoods, neighborhoods that we all love, Florence, Ward 3, up in Leeds, to get them into conformance. So with the proposal you have before you, if it's accepted, about 99% of the single family houses will now be conforming. And a good number of those two and three family houses will be conforming. Who cares? Well, the people who own the houses care because a conforming house allows the homeowner to do a lot more to the house. They could do renovations to the house. They can do additions to the house. They can add structures to the house. Things that in a non-conforming lot, either it's impossible to do, or you have to go through a rather rigorous uh, permitting process through the zoning board, the planning board, and sometimes uh, even more. So um, with the proposals you have before you, what the Zoning Revisions Committee did was look at the neighborhoods that we liked and that all of us have liked from living in Northampton and tried to figure out a way to make the zoning reflect what's on the ground in those neighborhoods. And I think we did a pretty good job of trying to make those zoning recommendations to fit those, those neighborhoods. Um, the other thing the, the, the Zoning Revisions Committee did and the Planning Board has done and the City Council has now seen is we've applied design standards to these because there's a lot of worry that infill might bring houses that don't fit into the neighborhood. So as you'll see in the zoning changes that are proposed, there's design changes not just for the structure themselves, but also for parking, and for landscaping so that the, any infill that happens because of these changes is going to fit in with the character of the neighborhood both by the structure and by the actual layout of the lot. So I'm here to urge you to uh, adopt those. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over in maybe five years. I think it's four. Uh, and a lot of people have looked at the five years. So a lot of people have looked at these and there's been a lot of public input. Um, so thank you. And vote for the two and a half override. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Peg Keller's next.
Good evening, all. Peg Keller, Housing and Community Development Planner. I live at 210 Main Street. Feel <laughs> 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 that way. I just want to express my appreciation to the Zoning Review Subcommittee, the Planning Board, for diligently working to translate the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan into the regulatory structure of the zoning ordinance. A committee's zoning is the blueprint for its future, and the revisions that are proposed, and I'm um, making my comments pertinent to items 13 through 16 in your section of order conferences in your agenda tonight. But those revisions could potentially create more affordable housing units by providing opportunities for possibly smaller households, which um, a term we use is market rate affordable housing by virtue of increasing the density in some of these neighborhoods, which are is pretty much a reflection of what does exist, as Steve said. Um, smaller units are often more affordable to folks just by virtue of their size, and they could be what's called market rate affordable without any government subsidies or any additional assistance. So making the zoning changes and increasing the availability of units like that, either for rental or purchase for homeownership, I think are presenting some opportunities that a lot of folks in our community currently find challenging and there's not a whole lot available. So thank you. Thank you. Martha Acklesburg, please. Hi, I'm Martha Acklesburg. I live at 5 Hillcrest Drive in Florence. Um, I've been a member of the Northampton Housing Partnership for a little over a decade and was also an active participant in the sustainable Northampton planning process. Uh, and I want to speak tonight in support of the proposed zoning changes that you have before you. The partnership, as you all probably know, oversaw the creation of a housing needs assessment and strategic housing plan, which is available on the city's website a couple of years ago. We did that with the use of CPC funds, and that analyzed local demographics and prioritized housing needs. Among the findings of that study were that despite years of flat overall population growth, the number of households in Northampton is steadily increasing, particularly smaller households. Uh, our median household income has consistently been lower than that of the county and the state. Our housing prices remain high despite the relatively poor economic climate. And we continue to be in danger of losing population because people cannot afford to live in the community in which they grew up. The proposed zoning changes that focus on increasing density in areas within existing infrastructure and within walkable distances to downtown will expand opportunities for the creation of more units to address the needs of smaller households and particularly households with limited incomes. This is something the partnership strongly encourages. We've been committed to this for a long time, as many of you know, to assure that Northampton remains a diverse community with housing opportunities available for people at a range of income levels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe Tarantino. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address the council. My name is Joe Tarantino, and I live at 110 North Elm Street. Northampton cannot raise taxes fast enough. That is the premise behind the override. The people who have the yes signs on their lawn are saying, without the override, Northampton cannot raise taxes fast enough because we have a budget shortfall. Well, I'm looking at this situation because it's not new to Northampton having budget shortfalls. So a good example is the city of Detroit, which is this week, I think it is, in default. It is on the verge of bankruptcy because they have a budget gap. It's a common problem all over the country. Okay? The view in Detroit has been from one party for 40 years that the problem of a budget shortfall is always that the people are undertaxed. Looking at it another way, does the city spend too much? Well, when the city spends money, there's a tangible benefit. So if I take a dollar for you, from you 
and get 10 cents of tangible benefit, that's going to be enticing to people who can't see the intangible benefit of not spending the money or not borrowing the money or not taxing the money. So my particular situation is I pay $6,000 in property taxes a year. So unless I move, I'm going to pay $60,000 to the city of Northampton in the next 10 years, and I don't get to throw out a bag of trash because I have to pay extra for that. I don't get to flush a toilet because I have to pay extra for that. I don't get to take my own car and park it in my own driveway without paying the city an excise tax, so I have to pay the city of Northampton for that on top of the $60,000. So what I hear from the yes people is I'm free riding. I'm only paying $60,000 in the next 10 years, and I'm somehow deliberately gaining benefit from abundant government services in excess of $60,000. And to the extent that there's an excess that I'm benefiting that I'm not paying for, my taxes need to be raised because $60,000 in the next 10 years is free riding. I'm not paying my fair share. I, you need more of my money. And that's without the override. The override, we will definitely have more opportunities to vote for an override. I guarantee it in the next 10 years. This isn't a fleeting problem of uh, wanting to raise taxes more than the law allows. What separates Northampton from Detroit is Detroit raised all the taxes they wanted and chased away their tax base. Northampton has a check and balance of the very fact of the override, which itself, just scheduling the override, is an admission of failure that you can't see that the government spends too much money rather than the people, the pro they're the problem because they're not being taxed enough. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Captain Jean LaFrance, please. Good evening, I'm Jean LaFrance from Cold Meadow Road. I'm disappointed to learn how easily very intelligent, well-meaning, well-educated, even high-ranking military men have been seduced into supporting this city's demanded two and a half million dollar override by simply having their attention diverted from the true reason for the city's alleged financial problems as easily as a magician performs his magic or a pickpocket steals valuables from a person. A psychological distraction in this case is the city's threat to lay off teachers, police officers, and gut the school system of its art, music, and athletic programs. The human mind cannot handle more than one task successfully at the same time. The mind instinctively concentrates on what it perceives to be its greatest threat, becoming oblivious to anything else. If a person can be tricked into focusing on a single tree, they will become totally oblivious to the surrounding forest. Call it tunnel vision. An Air Force officer may better understand the phenomenon if I spell it out as target fixation. The last time I witnessed the results of target fixation, one of my squadron's pilots making a bombing run was so concentrating on hitting his target, he flew his jet fighter straight into the ground, literally hitting his target dead center. I and a half dozen other Marines went out to the crash site to recover that pilot's remains. What we recovered from that man, we could hold in the palm of my hand. Target fixation is surely detrimental to your health and welfare, but the same target fixation on the wrong subject as far as our city's override is concerned, is detrimental to every homeowner, property owner's financial well-being. This city's government has never had a lack of property tax money to fund its school, its police, or any other, other departments. If this city's government didn't spend millions of dollars buying up worthless pieces of swamp and wilderness, practicing the luxury of building playing fields, bike paths, and boathouses, there wouldn't be any damn $1.4 million alleged shortfall in next year's budget. There would be a multi-million dollar surplus in the city's treasury. I am challenging every property owner, owning taxpayer, and every registered voter to do their own active homework in this proposed $2.5 million override. If this city's government is able to pull off this very well schemed distraction successfully, it will be a successful in awarding its property-owning taxpayers what we in the Marine Corps 
would call the purple shaft with a barbed wire cluster. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Linda Rom, please. My name is Linda Rom. I live in URB on Olive Street, and I'm here to voice my su support for the proposed uh, zoning changes. I respectfully request that the council move forward on this and take a vote and finish this before the summer recess starts, and that this vote be a favorable favorable one for the betterment of Northampton and the enhancement of Northampton. I feel that this will help people and families to remain in Northampton and allow for a greater opportunity and ranges of housing for other people to come to Northampton. With that, I think it will help our tax base and it will help our businesses in town. And this will also bring our neighborhoods in Northampton back to their original intent. I appreciate all the work that's been done and I hope that we can move forward so that we can deal with other bigger issues. Thank you. Uh, Swami Nathan. Good evening. My name is Hamid Swami Nathan. I live at 149 North Maple Street, Street in Florence. I'm here to uh, in, express my support for the zoning proposed zoning changes. Um, I'm a renter, of a single income. I'd like to live closer to town. Um, it's just prohibitive from a from a cost standpoint. Um, I think uh, by implementing the proposed changes, that it'll open up options and effectively. Um, give us more opportunity for affordable housing. So I encourage the council tonight, soon, to take a vote on this and uh, move it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pocky Whelan, please. Hi, I'm Pocky Whelan. I live at 3 Langworthy Road. Um, I'm here to speak in support of City Councilor Owen Dan Freeman Daniels' resolution calling for justice in Guantanamo Bay, which quite explicitly says justice means closing it. Justice means this city council taking an action to instruct the president and our congressmen and our senators to do everything they can as hastily as possible to close down this place, which is a blight <coughs> on every ideal that Americans hold. And I think it's important for our council to do this for a couple of reasons. One is historically people who have been on the side of justice have spoken to presidents. Uh, Randolph and others came before FDR and said, you have to get justice for the African American people. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt, then president, said, make me do it. Martin Luther King came before Lyndon Baines Johnson, president, and said, we need civil rights. We need to end apartheid in the South. We need voting rights. And Lyndon Johnson said, make me do it. In February of 2003, many of us joined with millions of people around the world demanding that the United States not go into this ill planned and executed, or soon to be executed, war against the Iraqi people. And the next day, the New York Times said, there are two great powers, there are two superpowers. One is the United States, and one is the people of the world. And you, as our city council, are representing us, the people of the world. And so we ask you to take this up the ladder to the people, speak for us. There are men who have been charged to, and have been found guilty of nothing. There are so many people in Guantanamo, 160 plus men in Guantanamo, over 100 of them are on hunger strike. Even the ethical doctors in this country are saying you cannot, doctors cannot ethically help support the force feeding of these men. Uh, we are in this desperate moment, and if we want to enliven any of the ideals of this country, we have got to stop the torture that is happening in our names. So thank you, uh, Owen, for this resolution, and I encourage you to please pass it. Thank you. Greg Jones. <laughs> Greg Jones. Uh, good evening. I'm Greg Jones. I live at 42 Graves Avenue. 
Um, originally, I had planned to come here to speak solely um, on the easement issue uh, pertaining to historic Northampton and uh, um, the city um, in trying to eradicate a storm drainage issue that um, the Bridge Street Elementary School is dealing with right now. Um, we, as a, as a street, I'm sure you'll remember, came before the City Council to talk to folks about a planning board issue which they had planned to purchase um, a strip of property, a 19-foot strip of property, which was the back of historic Northampton, um, and the City Council um, voted on that issue. Um, and so uh, we then found out that there was an easement that was being requested. Um, and we weren't really given a lot of notice with that, but we uh, found out about it and we scheduled our meetings. We met um, with the city services uh, director, David Pomerantz. We met with uh, David Valenta of the DPW. Um, we met with uh, a couple of our city councilors, our councilor at large. We met with the city council president. Um, and we also met with the mayor. Um, and the reason for that meeting and all of those meetings was to bring into clear focus um, what uh, was actually at stake uh, at the end of our street. But actually having folks there to see the end of Graves Avenue and the closeness of the end of the street to the playground and that wooded area and how important that is to the integrity of our street um, was important to us. Planning board, um, the gentleman who spoke first said that there's outreach and they spent eight, 18 months reaching out to the community on uh, the zoning changes. Um, I wish they had spent 18 months reaching out to us. Uh, we just found out that uh, the public way question, which is the thing that really kind of derailed um, the drainage being worked on last year uh, because it hadn't been determined whether uh, the end of our street was a public way or not. Um, is being voted on now, uh, along with the other streets. And the planning board has asked that Graves Avenue be connected to the elementary school. Um, and they've asked uh, that, it, in strong language, that that be the case. So um, we're a little befuddled. You know, we've gone through a, a laborious process. We've tried to be as available to folks as possible. Um, many of us have lived there many years. There's folks that have lived on that street close to 40 years. Um, none of them um, could have been here in less than the hour that we just heard about this. So, um, you know, notice and acceptability, just we're here to, uh, to be part of the process, and I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Krinkchak. Hi, my name is Barbara Cruikshank. I live at 52 Olive Street, Northampton, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the proposed zoning changes. For many of the reasons that have already been stated, issues of affordability, accessibility, um, increasing the tax base, and so on, and I'm particularly mindful of the very careful vetting that these proposed changes have gone through. Um, it's been a lengthy process, and. All due diligence has been observed, and I encourage the council to vote on this post haste with all due respect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Warner, please. Uh, Stuart Warner, 68 Prince Street. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Um, I bought a property, uh, a rental property, this April. Uh, my sons and I are doing renovations and doing our part to fuel the local economy through Foster Farr. And um, the, uh, this building has a non-conforming unit. Um, I've met with Carolyn Mish several times, seeing if there's any way to work out a way to make it legal. Um, uh, and there's none, of course. Uh, our attorneys said that the recommendation is to evict the woman uh, because there are very real liabilities for tenants and landlords uh, under um, uh, non-conforming units. Um, so I, I drew up my talking points and uh, sat down with the woman, and um, by the end of the conversation, I, I chickened out. Um, part of it's financial. The, the uh, renovations are expensive. Uh, the neighbors have thanked us because uh, they appreciate what we've done to the property. We're paying taxes for, for four units, uh, of course. And, um, but the main reason was this poor woman had been living there for 12 years, uh, innocently, thinking that she was legitimate. 
Um, she's a business owner downtown Northampton. She had no place to go, uh, was shocked, um, and then had called uh, after our conversation and uh, was saying how little sleep she was getting because she, she couldn't believe the news I'd given her. But um, the issue is it was, it was going to affect her life very badly. Um, and other tenants had spoken in her favor. They thought she was an integral part of the uh, apartment. So I just wanted to voice that um, I support the zoning changes because um, it has real impact on hundreds of residents in Northampton. It would legitimize their residency. It would legitimize their relationship with their landlord. And um, I think improve the living conditions for so many people. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Fred Schaefer, please. Hi, my name is Fred Schaefer. I live at 24 Paquette Avenue. Um, and I would like to also speak out in favor of the proposed zoning changes, and I echo what a number of people have already said, um, especially Peg Keller. Um, I am currently a renter in AURC uh, zone. I've been living in Northampton for two years. I love this city. I would love to become a homeowner, uh, but right now it is simply out of my reach financially. I would love to be able to afford something, and I think these zoning changes would uh, generate more affordable units. And I would love to um, be able to contribute taxes and to um, uh, help the city out that I love financially. And I realize that in these kinds of um, meetings, it's homeowners who tend to speak the loudest because they have already the most at stake. But I would just urge you to, to, um, to not forget that there are renters out there, too, that want to become more permanent mem <coughs> members of this, this community and to uh, also take into consideration the kinds of interests and needs that, that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Kirby, Mike, <coughs> Mike Kirby, uh, 17 Summer Street. No, nope, I'm not 17 Summer anymore. <laughs> I was <just> <laughs> <say>. <laughs> it's magic. Uh, I am now on North Street, I'm 134 North Street. And I would like to speak a cautionary note about the, the matter before you about the zoning change. That <clears throat> originally it went through a group called the ZRC, or the Zoning. Re CRC committee, and it was, yeah. <clears throat> and one of the strong the summaries of the that came out was that they didn't want to have when people came out to the hearings. They were very clear. They didn't want to have a severe impact on any one neighborhood. And in this case, um, because because of the way. The peculiar way that the um, the land going into the meadows is divided in a series of very long, narrow lots that, that average between <coughs> I don't know 100, 100, age 100 feet. Um, they're very deep, and right now they're a green belt next to the dike. And this particular zoning change is going to mean that they can put garden apartments into these narrow lots and they average between sometimes 14, 17 units they can put in what is already a very crowded neighborhood of small houses. Some of them, a lot of them are duplexes. And so I'm very much in favor of Owen Daniels' measure, which I think he's going to offer to <clears throat> to give, if, if there are more than seven units, that, the per, that they have to go and get a special permit. That site plan review does not provide any really significant uh, safeguards to the local community, to the, to the neighborhood. So that's what I want to talk about. In my 31 seconds remaining, I wish to say that I am against the override. 
that we have gone to the same well too many times and too many people are suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Arlene Corbett, please. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Arlene Corbett and I live at 38 Fort Hill Terrace and I'm here to talk about Proposition Two and a Half. 25 years ago, I was a single mom raising a son all by myself. When my son wanted to go to preschool, I paid for it myself. I paid for that schooling. My son wanted to take gymnastics. I paid for that. When my son wanted to take swimming lessons, I also paid for that. I didn't expect my town to pay for my, my son's swimming lessons. When my son uh, needed something, with, I, I just did it. I saved my money. I saved for four years of college education for him. Then again, I didn't expect any handouts. I lived within my budget. I cut back if I needed to cut back. I expect the city of Northampton to cut back and to live within their budget also. What this override means to me is equal the price of an airline ticket to go visit my son who can't afford to live here. I love my son. I miss my son dearly. Two and a half override is However, expected to pay, how is two and a half override ever to, uh, to expect for your son's daughter or son's education? If you are paying much higher taxes year after year after year, isn't this about education, this override? With this constant overrides, fire station, high school, police station, general overrides with more to come. Will you also face 10 years from now because your sons or daughters can no longer live here and you cannot pay for their college education? Give two and a half some thought. What does it really mean for your sons and daughters in the near future? Thank you. Uh, Richard White, please. My name is Richard White. I live at 33 Northern Avenue downtown. I'm here to uh, ask for your support and the new zoning ordinances. My wife and I bought a property, our first home in town, uh, 15 years ago. It was on the classic uh, 100 by 100 lot that was originally set up in 1913 by the Martin Estate for a series of 50 wide by 100 lots. And we would like to retire and stay in Northampton. And if we could subdivide that lot and build a little cool happening affordable unit and sell the house we're in right now, we could actually provide affordable housing for two families. So I think the idea is great. I appreciate all the work that everyone has done to look at the impacts as fully as you can. And uh, I hope that you can act on this and I can uh, start building it a little home in Northampton for my wife and I. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marcy Clark, please. Hi. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Marcy Clark. I live at 84 William Street. And actually in the neighborhood that Mike Kirby was referring to, and so I'm glad that he sort of provided that introduction because I'm here probably uh, to say something a little bit different than most everybody <laughs> except Mike which is that expressing some concern about the zoning proposal you have in front of you, and particularly the concern that, that other my neighbors, people that live in my neighborhood, have expressed over time. And, and essentially it rests on this issue of the changing character of existing neighborhoods. And I think it's written into the zoning proposal, and it's something that should not just be a throwaway phrase designed to appease citizens in neighborhoods who are concerned about the types of development that Mr. Kirby suggested. Um, but that, in fact, it is very key and very central, and that all neighborhoods are not the same, and the character is not the same. Um, my neighborhood has participated in this process actively. They've expressed concerns, and at this stage, they still have grave concerns about the proposal that's in front of you. So they, they're, they're, perhaps there has been a participatory process, and they have participated. Actually, the reason, the thing that compels me to speak in front of you right now is that um, 
is, is the idea of uh, sort of competing things going on with the, op with the planning department. We have two hands. On the one hand, there's zoning, and there's an ideological position that infill is a good thing. Um, I'm not altogether convinced that years down the road we're going to decide that perhaps infill wasn't such a great idea. Crowding is an issue. Overcrowding has been in, an issue in history as well. And so the idea of increasing density at all, at, at any point possible, I think, is something that we should enter into extremely carefully. So on the one hand, we have this ideology of infill and that infill is a good thing. On the other hand, from the, also from the um, Office of Planning Development, we have open space and a whole open space plan and um, the desire to, to preserve open space. And open space exists in big places, but it also exists in small places like it does in my neighborhood, which includes people's, uh, what, 100 foot by very long, thin yard. There is open space there. It is a greenway that Mr. Kirby mentioned. And that is also important to the Office of Planning De and Development. And I don't exactly know how these things coexist. Our neighborhood, for one, has had to fight to preserve the little open space that we've had. So even though, even though there hasn't been a zoning change just yet, that has been a dynamic in our, in our neighborhood. And the last thing, the third issue that's coming up, is stormwater. We have a stormwater issue. And, uh, and the current condition of our very old and aging system and its capacity to handle the current volume of runoff from impervious surfaces, which equates buildings and pavement and other roadways and parking lots. And so infill also lies in contrast to that um, and, and more infill development. And so what confuses me is that there are these major issues. They need to be considered in, together. They do not exist in isolation. That yet we seem to try to make big decisions as if they do. And I rely upon you to take a larger issue and consider all of these factors when you make a decision on any one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Steve Susco. <clears throat> Before I start, I got a biohazard situation here. I removed a tick from and uh, don't want it to be done that <laughs> Well, okay. <laughs> Lyme disease, if you've had no, it. No, you know, I've, 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 uh, I've never. Leave it down it. here for the secretary. For the next speaker. Okay. All right. you Thank you. From me, I, I saved the mayor. You saved the mayor. <laughs> points, points. Mr. Susco, that uh, is a public record that Mr. Susco has saved the mayor from potential Lyme disease. Thank you. Give, give him 10 extra seconds. Uh, uh, Susco. Steve Susco, 754 Bridge Road, <coughs> SUSCO. I went to an override forum last evening and I wasn't allowed to speak or ask a question. This doesn't speak well for <coughs> you or we or us, more on that later. I'm not voting to, to override for many reasons, most of which you will prevent me from expressing here. One, I can't afford it. You recently caused me more than $20,000 in property damage not including your injury to my body, and then you thumbed your nose to me. In two, number two, in 2005 or so, you forgave my neighbor, the undeserving Northampton nursing home, some $200,000 in back taxes. From what I gather now, you're poised to repeat it or, no, or more in order to facilitate its sale. I say no. Don't ask me to raise my taxes and others' taxes while you allow and approve these huge, undeserved, and unwarranted massive tax reliefs. My challenge to you here is to preclude this unwarranted tax relief. Will you pledge this? I don't think so. Number three, I received this flyer recently stuffed in my door. Yes, Northampton. Uh, a full critique would take some time you won't grant me. The color scheme, red, white, and blue, jumps out as psychological propaganda. As I read this, it became extremely confusing. Who is we? Who is us? Is we us? Is us we? Is we or us the city government? Is we or us a political action committee? Yes, Northampton is a political action committee, not city government. I'm saying stop confusing citizens, especially taxpayers. In your flyer, again, a small burr in my saddle, websites, emails, gmails, for questions and more information here. But nothing for landliners and old dinosaurs and those without the means to participate in your e-world, patently elitist as usual. And four, finally, 
Your flyer says, quote, why do we need an override, missing question mark, unquote. Your flyer's answer, quote, the drastic cuts in state aid are the largest single reason we face this physical crisis, unquote, and quote, while we have pursued every possible means to cover this whole sick, we can't, unquote. Then, therefore, ought this not be and, and have been our or we or better yet your focus here? Tell me or we or us in details and specifically, are these public records and are there public records to back it up? And could I finish this? How many resolutions have you promulgated, approved, and delivered on this here? Show me your effort and passion here. Who and how much political capital have you expended here? <laughs> Who of you has gone to the wall politically here? Has anyone here besides Councillor Tacey risked any political life and limb here? Tell me. I know you can't. There's nothing to tell. The fact is we and or us, but especially you, haven't pursued every possible means to cover this. Your flyer is a sham. Your answers here are no and none. Therefore, my answer is no. And ours or we's or whomever's answers ought to be no. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of the people who signed up. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak at this time? Mr. Corbett? David Corbett, Ford Hill Terrace. Congratulations to my wife. You did a good job. Anyway, uh, I got summoned to jury duty last Monday. But my number didn't come up, thankfully, because I would have had to go and tell the judge that I had compassion. I couldn't make up my mind whether or not I could punish a person. I'm not an attorney. Attorneys, I guess, are trained to have no compassion when it's in the legal world. But this is not the legal world. This is people's future in this city. You know, we're going to have this Proposition 2 and a half override. The other night it was even admitted. People have known people that were forced out of the city because of the money. People are going to be in trouble come February. February is when we're going to get the first amount on our tax bill. Also, your $200 or $300 heating bill. The worst time of the year. You know, if people, this country's foundation was for the people, not for the arts, not for everything else, and maybe it's time you eliminate the special, the arts programs, the music programs, and start looking at history longer. Study the history of this country and the kids will have a better life later. You know, this is not the thing that you want to teach kids too. You know, it's more important to have art and it's more important to have music than to have your neighbor be able to stay in their, their or her home. A lot of people I talk to, I talked to a lady the other night. I called her up, she wanted a no sign. But then she was worried she was going to be vandalized if she had one on her lawn. This is what this city is coming to? I remember the city as being proud, where everybody was together. And I said it one time before, that the old telephone numbers were 584, J-U-4, Justice 4. And it should be justice for all, not for a few. This is a witch hunt. You're going out four years. The military wars are starting to be over. The people are coming home. Where are they going to live? The money that you sent to, uh, you told Washington, bring our tax dollars home. Well, they're going to come home. We're going to put somebody out of their home because it's a witch hunt? No. Vote no. Thank you. Is there someone else who'd wish to see this time? There, and then Jackie, you're next. Good evening. My name is Stelia Martinez. I live at 289 Elm Street. I was at the meeting last night 
for the override and a couple of things were really confusing. Uh, the mayor had a billboard uh, talking about the next four years and how he expects to use the money for mostly situations with the school system. And then the newspaper, other people, the state, you know, the government agencies that I have called to verify information. You know, this override is forever. It's not just for four years. And obviously, after reading the newspaper every single day, like I always do, I see that there are a lot of people in Northampton totally confused of what's going on because the information that they do give to the paper in their letter or column is not all true. And the mayor had said in one of the meetings that he gave um, in different parts of the city that um, the, the CPA could not be used for anything else. I remember that when the voting for the CPA, um, they never said that it was going to be four times a year. I get my tax bill and it's $168 times four times because the bill comes every four times, you know, four times a year. So that's times four. And every year it's more and more money. So it's not just the override. It's all these other things that we have to, to pay. And the situation is that things are getting more expensive. And there are many people that choose not to work and stay home. I chose to work and secure medical and all kinds of things for myself. But college is very expensive. When my daughter graduated from college, it was $35,000 for Smith College. Now it's 50,000. All these people that have little children, multiply that for how many children you have. And then think, right now you're 40, but when you're 60, um, you know, your partner or your spouse, are they gonna be supporting you? Or are they gonna have a heart attack or an accident or something? And what are you gonna do with yourself? What are you gonna be left with after you worked all your life? So. The problem with a school that is overspending so much in so many things and restoring 0.7 of an art teacher or 0.5 of a music teacher, my kids went through schools. Just one thing. And I felt that they have very old books and very old things, but they study hard. They went through college, they have good professions, and the teachers are the only ones working really hard. So I just don't think that it's fair to have an override forever. To help out with one year or four years, I'm reasonable. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> is here. My name's Jackie Misa, and I live at 95 West Street in town. I'm sorry, I'm going to read for the most part. In 2008, I worked for Valley Communications Systems in Chicopee. At that time, I was an. Sure. Ah, the clock. Okay, hey, we'll start. We'll start off. <laughs> okay. In 2008, I worked for Valley Communications Systems in Chicopee. At that time, I was an executive assistant and a sales assistant in the telephone division. In 2008, one year before the last general override, the city of Northampton purchased a citywide telephone system from Valley Communication Systems. The city hired a paid consultant, which wasn't necessary, to assist with the process, designed a system, and posted an RFP. Given the complex nature of the RFP request for proposals, there were very few responses. Valley Communications chose to submit a bid. Also knowing the city's financial straits, Valley Communications asked to submit a second alternate proposal in addition to the requested proposal. The city said no, it would not accept 
an alternate proposal using state approved pricing. The, the requested proposal came in at well over half a million dollars, over 600,000. When the city's consultant presented um, Valley Communications' proposal to city council, some mention was made of state pricing. The city's consultant said that the system was priced, um, also priced under the state contract, but um, there was no difference. Not one city councilor requested comparative figures. If they had, there would have been none to present. It wasn't possible to quote what, was, um, what the city asked for off of the state contract. Valley Communications offered to submit, excuse me, sorry, to submit a second um, comparable, pro pro bleh, comparable proposal, essentially a better product for a better price, under state pricing. The city refused. Then city councilor David Narkowitz supported the purchase, also bringing examples of comparable, comparably sized systems in Westport, Connecticut and Washington State, neither having anything to do with procurement in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so the city spent well over $600,000 on the phone system the year before the 2009 general override. This past year, among other things, we have seen the city purchase um, brand new SUVs as opposed to the customary sedans um, for the brand new police station and the brand new garage. Um, $40,000 art now graces the railroad to downtown rail, uh, rail trail bridge. Um, art and music and language all have merit in the schools. That's, that's my opinion, that's how I feel. Um, but in the past three weeks, um, the city has posted a position for a golf coach. Can I summarize? Yeah. At the high school? Yeah. Counselor, I've heard Counselor Schwartz say a number of times um, that she's scared. Um, I think most of us are all scared. <coughs> scared of losing businesses, houses, apartments. The city needs to step up to the plate and learn to manage its budget, as do the majority of residents who have managed to hold on so far. Uh, the, this latest override is again forever. Um, please ask city administrators to do their jobs and please vote no. Another small aside regarding the yes campaign, um, the vote yes people do have a political campaign and according to city records, they've raised approximately $8,000 for their campaign. And you're shaking your head yes, but I say shame, shame on them if they're so ardent, in fact, and so affluent, either or both, that money, that eight grand should go straight into the schools and not into a political campaign. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Mac Everett, 40 Valley Street, and I want to take just a couple of minutes to echo uh, the comments that Mike Kirby made and also Marcy Clark made. I live in the neighborhood, that same neighborhood as Marcy, and I'm specifically concerned about that area between Henry Street and the dike that Mike, Mike referred to and the potential for possible um, large-scale developments in there. Um, I serve on the, the traffic common committee in the neighborhood, and I'm very aware that the, the road and sidewalk infrastructure in neighborhood is very dated the roads are very narrow the sidewalks are in tough shape some of the roads don't have sidewalks and also our neighborhood is used typically as a cut through by commuters who are uh, going from Route 5 Pleasant Street to Route 9 and vice versa so we have a fairly good amount of traffic in the neighborhood and I'm concerned that um, among other things that the uh, influx an influx of new development in that particular area would be very taxing on that infrastructure. Um, that, that's basically it. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Philip Cass. Uh, I was just was told by Greg Jones today that the, the issue about the uh, easement at the end of Graves was Graves Avenue was on, on, on the table tonight. Um, just quickly, I, I just, 
I, I'm a property owner at the end of Graves. Um, the city requested of me uh, an easement for this project. Um, I was initially somewhat skeptical, mistrustful, I have to say, um, because only months previous there had been a, an issue on a, uh, the same piece of land that had been uh, proposed based on a, a problem that was stated to exist at the school and, um, and so a supposed solution that the uh, city planner had said that that purchase would re result in. Uh, the city council heard that case, and I don't need to rehash it. Uh, the merits were sorted out. I think ultimately the, the city council realized, as we did in the neighborhood, that there really was not a very well articulated problem, and there was certainly uh, a absolutely non-articulated solution to, to the problem, and the city council kind of tabled it. So when I was contacted somewhat later about a similar this, I was skeptical. I was referred to David Valletta, and I just would say that, again, I was told that there's a problem, and, and I, I can't dis I, I'm not somebody, I don't know anything about drainage. I take the city and the, and, and at their word, and I take them at their word that this will, this drainage easement that I've granted and the, is on the table tonight further to, to complete the path will take care of the problem. I, I, I take the city at their word um, that this drainage problem that we're diverting very close to my property is not going to cause me any addition, drainage issues uh, in, in, at my property. And um, I take the city at the word, at the word that this project has nothing to do with the last one and is not an inroad to some future plan. Um, and I, I take the, so I, that, I guess, and that, in fact, this is a separate, isolated situation purely having to do with the drainage. And, I, and that being the case, I, I, I'm the easement. And, 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 and that any damage that is caused, when I spoke to David Valletta as well, when he explained this to me, whether it be to, would be repaired and that the inconvenience would be as minimal as possible to tenants and, and, and the citizens of the street. So I just would say thank you. Thank you. We've been at this for an hour. Uh, anyone else? Okay. We will actually now go back and reconvene. Um, <coughs> public hearings, right? We're, uh, we're about to convene a public hearing. Um, this is the application for license to advertise in accordance with Chapter 148, General Laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The application made by the City of Northampton Department of Public Works for uh, the lawful use herein described building or other surf, uh, structure for a license to use the land on which such building or other structure is to be situated and only to such extent as shown on the plot plan which is filed in uh, filed with and made part of this application that's at 125 Locust Street um, and this is for the uh, this is addressing uh, uh, fuel tanks storage and uh, Rich Parcelletti is here. He's representing the Department of Public Works and Rich. I see him back there. Um, do you, uh, well, actually, since this is a hearing, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Here. Here. Present. Here. 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 Present. Uh, okay. Um, so we'll hear from the proponents first. Uh, that would be you, Rich, I'm guessing. So if you want to step up and. Is that Rich Parcel? Oh, it's the tie. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It, it, this is pretty unusual. I, I have to say, I, it struck me as well. It should not. <laughs> I'm not sure I can speak now, counselors. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, 
scheduling this this evening. Um, we are in the process of uh, becoming uh, USD compliant um, at uh, this site, which is the main public works yard for a uh, storage of our uh, fuels that we use for our operations of the department. Um, this uh, process is uh, driven by the state where we are to be compliant, and this is one of the pieces of the puzzle. So we have been working on this for about the last uh, 10 months or so. So um, this is part of the pe one, one piece of the puzzle of uh, several. And it will be dealing with the other edition of the puzzle that in the next year. So are there any questions? Actually, um, are there any opponents to this proposal? Anyone who wish to speak to this? <coughs> uh, move for uh, to close the public hearing. I move to close the public Second. hearing. Second. Actually, but, yeah. sorry. Just a question since we have the papers in front of us, but the folks watching at home really don't know what's being proposed. Could you have Rick explain to us? Sure. Right. No, but we, we, we can do that, I think, even in the context of the closed public hearing. Right. Some questions if you want to ask. Yeah. Uh, okay. It, well, what's the preference? The preference is clearly not to close the public hearing, so let's keep okay. it open then. Um, you want it, Do you want to ask questions, uh, Councilor Casey or Councilor? Well, I may after Rich actually explains to us what they're proposing to do in the first place. Um, but basically what we're proposing to do is that we are proposing to um, license the department to store fuel at the, at the public works yard. This is something that has been around for uh, many years, uh, and unfortunately, for some particular reason, we have never had a license to do so. Um, back in um, 2012, um, DEP made uh, all uh, underground storage tank uh, owners, which includes uh, Public Works in Massachusetts, all across the state, be USD compliant through a um, third-party source that actually comes in and inspects all of our tanks and everything. And through this process, we found out that we were, did, we were lacking a license. We didn't have a license. So we have to have uh, come in front of the council to... Uh, so you're so you're not proposing any changes in no, your no, activity? No, no, You're just licensing what We're just licensing. This is actually somewhat of a formality because the tanks are already in the ground. We're not changing anything, but we have to have a license in order to operate. Okay. Councilor Jason and Councilor Labarge. The, uh, it, it reminds me, it's a housekeeping, I think, uh, thing here. It reminds me of the bus stops that we had without ordinances. And uh, they were, we had buses stopping without ordinances. We have to have an ordinance for a bus stop. So I intend to support this and I, uh, I think for me, it's a no-brainer. Um, you need the license. The state requires it. Yes, and I'm going to state the same thing. Also, you're here because you need the license. You never had to have a license before, correct? The capacity will be the same. Nothing That's correct. is changing. That's correct. Nothing, nothing is changing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, if I'm correct, then if we did not approve this, in fact, we'd have to cease all storage of our fuel. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and the fact is we probably were required to have a license. We, we, we have been required to have a license, and unfortunately I, I don't have an answer for you as to why we never had one. So um, this just brings our present no. practice. The, the these, tanks that were, the, these tanks we're talking about were installed in 1994, which was predated my term as highway superintendent before I was responsible for this operation, so I can't speak for that. Could but I ask what brought it to your attention? Because we had our, our third-party USD inspection. Uh, okay. Uh, back in September, which is required by the state, and so we have all this criteria that we have to meet, and this is one of the criteria that we did not uh, have in place, so this is why we're here this evening. Thank you. You're welcome. In what capacity does the fire department oversee this? The fire department issues us a permit to, to actually store the materials. We have to get a license from the city clerk's office to store the materials. So you have permits? We have a, one. We have a permit that's valid, but we don't have the license to actually store the fuel on site. So a prerequisite of the permit would be a license. That's correct. And for some particular reason, there was, it was an it was an unknown. It was unknown to me completely until all of this, you um, um, falling into this USD compliant happen. Okay. I I, rem I remember the tanks being installed in 1994, yep. but I was not part of, uh, yeah, the op that uh, part of the operations at the time. Okay. Thank uh, you. For the public's interest, this is uh, fuel storage to provide fuel for city vehicles. Yes. And it's a, it's a fuel depot, depot that's existed since 1994. 
It's, pro it's pr actually prior to that. Well, so, that's true. You've been providing fuel for 18, 1888. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, no, it was, uh, since uh, the 1950s, probably the 51, I think the department moved into that facility. <clears throat> One more. Uh, sure. The problem with the pumps has all been taken care of is that correct at one time we, we lost a pump or some such thing is that is that right well, we, we, we've, we've had obviously ongoing issues I mean the pumps are 94 they're they're reached uh, their the end of their life they're not at the end of their life but they are old and they can they do require a lot of maintenance at this juncture but they are functioning fine so okay so we we didn't replace them we, we just fixed them we, we we've repaired them they were replaced there was an old system at the department back when I first started in 89 um, two different types of tanks we moved into state compliance when we installed these new tanks in the new depot in 1994. And since then, we have been compliant with everything, with the exception now that the, we haven't had a license. Okay. And the replacement of those of the tanks and the pumps and all that in the fuel depot, it was all part of the, the DPW, the proposed facility. Is that correct? No. No. The, the storage facility that we presently have took the place of the existing storage facility that we had when the building was taken over by the department from 1951. Oh, okay. I thought so, it was part of the... Uh, no, okay. no, it is not. If there's no other public comment, I move we close the public hearing. Well, it's, it's been moved and moved and seconded. Um, uh, all those in favor of closing public hearing, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, Accept a motion for uh, approval of the Move license. Motion approval of the license. Second. Any discussion? Uh, roll call vote, please. Councilor Green Daniels? Aye. Councilor Barge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Short? Yes. Councilor Spencer? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Now, Rich, point don't of, go anywhere. Point of information I don't think we need a roll call vote on. Uh, we, we do for this an advertised uh, is the hearing yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, the, this is another application for the other tank I don't imagine the questions have changed much since then or the other comments but uh, we, we have questions. to open the public oh we have to convene the public, we'll open the public comment. second, second. Uh, and Rich is here as the proponent I don't, I'm not going to make you jump to this hoop but I'm actually this is the second I'm assuming the second tank uh, are there any? Is there anyone here who wish to speak in opposition of this proposal of this license? Anyone here who is just interested in speaking to this issue? Oh, one second. Oh, is it limited? The city now limited to just these two tanks? No, the tanks that you are the, this uh, this public hearing you, we're open right now is these are the tanks at the uh, Hockenham Road wastewater treatment plant. These tanks are used. Uh, one tank is used for diesel fuel, which is supplies the backup generator for the whole plant. Plus, it supplies the flood control. Um, large uh, discharge pump and the other tank is a 3,000 gallon gasoline tank that is used to strictly supply the two gasoline sterling engines in the flood control building and then is, uh, are these the only unlicensed ones that we know yes that, that is point? yes yeah I would imagine the same thing you have permits but no, no that's license. correct yes and are these underground tanks also yes they are they are yeah. both yes okay thank you any other discussions questions uh, I'll accept the motion to close the public hearing. Motion closed. And second. All those in favor of closing public hearing? Aye. 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 Opposed? Veterans? All right. Any other people? Move to approve. And, yep. I uh, need a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second it. All right. A roll call, please. Council Yes. 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 Aye. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you, Councilor. your time. Thank you. Love to tie. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> sure. It takes some getting used to. Now, we have another public hearing. This is for a petition for pole and wire locations <coughs> on the National Grid on Haydenville Road. The owner is stepping up to the bench. Yes. Lisa Jasinski with National Grid. Uh, sh uh, we're actually going to accept a motion to open the public hearing. Make a motion to open up the public Second. hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye
Yes, I will. This is uh, just a proposal to set a stub pole on uh, Haydenville Road. It's near the Williamsburg line, and it's across the street from the driveway that goes to house number 595. Right now, that line extension that goes up to that house is supported with a tree guy. Uh, the pole in the street on that side of the road is um, it's guided into a tree across the street. That's dead and needs to be removed. So we need to still support the line. We would like to put up a stub pole across the street to use as a supporting fixture. Um, the proponent has spoken. Uh, are there any opponents? Anyone else would be interested in that address? Uh, Councilors who have questions for Lisa? Uh, I don't really have any questions. I actually I visited the site. Um, it is. It's a dead tree. Uh, they replaced the tree or replace the guide wire to a pole. You're removing the tree? We don't typically remove the tree if there's a request. It's you're sitting back a little bit. Yep. You know, we'd have to be driving into the property a little bit to get to it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. Is this because of a development or something that's occurring? No, it's now? an existing extension. There's a couple poles that go along up the driveway to this house. Okay. And so you know, it's going to pull the wires will pull the street pole towards the house. You have to just anchor it on the other side of the street. <clears throat> right now, it's 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 into a trace. That's and I'll note for the record that it's close to headquarters. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All those in favor of closing? Aye. 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 Now we'll vote on uh, the petition. I'll accept the motion. So to accept. Second it. Council uh, Murphy? Yes. 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 Council Yes. Yes. Now, uh, is the scheduled time for uh, communications from the mayor? I know the mayor probably has a few communications, but thank you, Lisa. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, mayor, do you wish to speak at this time, or? Okay. Um, now we're up to. Oh, do we get to speak at the mayor? Always. No. Just wanted to thank you very much for participating last night in the forum at the Bridge Street School. Thank you. Next up is a resolution. This is upon the recommendation of Council Maureen T. Carney, William H. Dwight, Council Jesse M. Adams, and Council Marion Barge. And this is a resolution to support vibrant sidewalks. Uh, I'll accept the motion to put it on the floor. Um, I'll move you read the resolution. You want, you want the re okay. Whereas urban planning professors Anastasia, oh, this is why you asked me to do this. She has an impossibly, these names are absolutely <laughs> impossible. Uh, Rachel Sedaris. Haiku Sedaris. <laughs> yes. And Rania Aaron. Oh, <laughs> Isn't that? Yeah. Yeah, just like they're spelled. Okay, yes. yeah. Well, how they're spelled. Oh, already getting the email. Saying an obscenity. Uh, identified five essential pur <laughs> uh, purposes of sidewalks in their compelling article, Vibrant Sidewalks in the United States. And whereas these essential purposes can be described as follows movement, sidewalks are how pedestrians move from one place to another, encounter. Sidewalks are places where you meet people, people you know, people you don't know, and people you might not want to know. And sometimes this purpose of the sidewalk trumps the movement purpose, as in when a street fair temporarily closes a pathway to normal traffic. Sidewalks are where, quote, spontaneous and planned festivities break the rhythm of everyday life and give collective expression to people's joy, sorrow, or aspirations, close quote. Confrontation. Not every activity that takes place on a sidewalk is comfortable. Rallies and protests, sit-ins, or even talking loudly might be disruptive or violate no social norms. Still, these activities should be rec uh, accommodated on democratic sidewalks. Survival. For some people, the sidewalk is home and the only place where they can carry out the ordinary activities of the daily life, eating and sleeping, than the rest of us more commonly do indoors. Sidewalks are also Often controversially, the places where some people like to panhandle, street vendors, or day laborers go to earn a living. Beauty. Sidewalks 
can be a place of lush beauty with trees, plants, street furniture, art, and other items that give the sidewalk and the community its, place, its own identity. And, okay, I'm sorry. And then whereas uh, the 2000, uh, 2011 Nelson Nygaard uh, design charrette focus on downtown Northampton called for the sidewalks mark markedly widened and Main Street narrowed to shorten crosswalks, increase safety, increase public space for foot traffic and in front of local businesses and provide an opportunity for more benches and whereas in 2005 a study entitled Northampton Streetscape Improvement Plan, Main Street and Pleasant Street was prepared by the Denig Design Associates Incorporated and called for, in addition to improving and widening the sidewalks, increasing seating along the Main Street and Pleasant Street. And whereas people are more likely to walk in areas that host a diversity of issues, and, and whereas street furniture allows for a city to be more of a community, an area to gather, share, and experience life together, and whereas benches provide pedestrians with an opportunity to sit and rest, wait for a bus where there isn't adequate bus shelter space, meet a friend, or read the paper. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council envisions sidewalks as spaces that can accommodate both enjoyable and disruptive activities, encourages a strategic review of both the Nelson Nygaard study and the Northampton Streetscape Improvement Plan, and calls for a sidewalk improvements and expanded street furniture along the entire length of Main Street. So, so moved. Second it. Moved and seconded. Any discussion with the, <coughs> the drafter like this? Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> this resolution came out of a recent uh, flurry of activity in Northampton. It's been a month or so since that, so um, may seem a little less timely, but <clears throat> it probably is still relevant for us to address some of the issues that really were brought to the surface in the uh, very active and lively community discussion. Uh, in <clears throat> conversations with uh, some of uh, the councillors, um, I looked at some of the issues that might really give a broad view to uh, what was the recent uh, controversy in Northampton and look more generally at the use of sidewalks <clears throat> and how we as our community uh, envision them. I found uh, this very uh, relevant and um, philosophically based article by planners, by experts in, in urban planning, that really spoke to the core of the issue, which is um, how, how cities might look at sidewalks. Very interesting, looked at the history of how sidewalks, which were once just very public spaces, became much more regula regulated um, in an effort to uh, narrow their focus to one of really just movement and ease of ease of movement. And this article <clears throat> really suggests that a return to the original open forum and quintessential public space, as some Supreme Court cases have referred to sidewalks, is one that brings them to their uh, vibrant status that we see Northampton as right now. And so I um, essentially gave that a, a, a careful look and um, then compared it or, or juxtaposed it to the recent studies that we did in Northampton. Um, if folks remember, there was the Nelson Nygaard study. That uh, was the uh, at the behest of the Transportation and Parking Commission. So it really, it initially looked at ease of transportation along um, King Street, Main Street, Pleasant Street, but one which really also addressed safety issues for folks that um, we know that with such a wide Main Street, uh, it's not really that safe for folks to get across. And at the same time, by widening sidewalks, narrowing the street, it allows for better use of those sidewalks and really integrating them into the community so that they can become the public spaces that really make for a great city. And that was also um, bolstered by a previous study in 2005 that we heard mentioned that was much more specific about how <coughs> we might make those sidewalk enhancements 
with plantings and street furniture. And so, as you can see, the reference to benches along here really has to do with um, some of the controversy that was stirred when we had a, a temporary experiment to take away benches. And this was a way to, to respond to that in a, in a way that was a little less highly charged, but one that looked <coughs> at work that's already been done in the city and asked us to take a, take a re-look at that and support um, a more broad view of downtown and the sidewalks. Council Lubar. Yes, I remember in 2005, that was a huge issue about the sidewalks and how are we going to improve the landscaping of the sidewalks. And if I can recall, we had one of the meetings at the old D.I. Sullivan School and it was packed. Um, I agree with the language in this resolution. I think sidewalks are very, very valuable no matter what city or what town. And they are used for a purpose, walking, meeting people, socializing, and everything that's in this resolution is what it's all about. Council Murphy. I'd actually like to suggest an amendment and let me explain why I would suggest it. I, I support the spirit and intent of this, but the specific language I think causes us a problem because really the, the only, you know, this came about because of, because of benches, not because of complaints about the way we police downtown. And really the only tools the police have to police downtown is disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace. And yet in confrontation, we identify protests, sit-ins, talking loudly and disruptive behavior as more or less endorsed by our resolution. Um, if I was in Councillor Adams's business and I had a client who had been arrested for disorderly conduct, this would be a blueprint for my defense saying, well, the city council in Northampton has in fact endorsed this sort of behavior in a resolution and therefore, why is their police department actually out charging my client with this? And, and the same kind of with survival. So my suggestion would be to um, <clears throat> confrontation, remove survival, and then modify, uh, now be it resolved, therefore, that the Northampton City Council and removes envision sidewalks as spaces that accommodate both enjoyable and disruptive activities and just say that the City Council of Northampton encourages a strategic review of both Nelson Nygaard and streetscapes. Um, because I don't, I don't think by this we intend to endorse disruptive behavior uh, in the form of disorderly conduct or disturbing the peace. And I don't think we're saying by this that this is the result of police misbehavior and enforcing those two standards of our community. I think what we're, we're saying is that the spirit of intent is we expect open, safe, accessible, friendly sidewalks. Um, and I'd be interested in people's opinion about that. Is you offering that as an amendment? I'm offering that as an amendment. Yes. Um, <clears throat> if that's to the maker of the motion. Or to anyone, just for discussion. Second. Because I'm sure these issues were not in the intent of our resolution. Uh, it's been motioned and seconded, and this is to the amendment, the proposed amendment, as, as you want to comment I absolutely agree. Last night we left, uh, or night before, excuse me, we left our meeting here. Uh, and I pulled out of the parking lot and took a left to head towards Florence. I don't think I've ever heard such screaming and swearing and carrying on. I was right behind the director of the public works. He actually got out of his car. We were stopped at the light to say, what's going on over there? It was brutal and it was, it was, it was disruptive behavior. Was at, and I, I don't want to endorse it. I don't know if I want to endorse sleeping on benches either. I don't think, a lot of people don't, I think because they're screwing boards in so you can't lay down on benches uh, in front of registry of deeds, a courthouse, and things such as that. Um, I just, um, I do support vibrant sidewalks. I absolutely do, there's no question about it. But I do think uh, there's some language in here that I do think that the police department will find 
cumbersome. Um, and uh, I, 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 I will support the amendment. Uh, Councilor Carr. Well, the reason that I would not support um, striking those sections is because they speak to the very heart of the resolution. That being that it's the very contrast of enjoyable and we can call it disruptive uh, activity that creates the vibrancy. It's that friction itself. And <clears throat> in some ways, you could look at um, uh, the civil right period of civil rights in the United States when African Americans refused to step aside for a white person walking down the street who might maintain that it's required that they step aside in order to um, facilitate my ease of, of mo movement. And that was the social norm during uh, Jim Crow. It really suggests that those social norms are, are they aren't necessarily held by all. And, and there are things that um, really our democracy relies upon, such as an ability <coughs> to engage in protest, engage in sit-ins, um, and that it, even though it may be uh, uncomfortable or unenjoyable to listen to people who may be speaking loudly, um, that that's part of what exists in a public space, in quintessential public spaces. So I, again, removing those very essential pieces of the, of the resolution would in effect pare it down to, um, to one that is completely counter to its original intent. At the point there was to show the contrast and to show that there is to be expected on vibrant and democratic sidewalks a considerable amount of, of contrast and so I understand that I understand that people would like to have pleasant and friendly and enjoyable um, uh, experiences, but I the point is that they should expect that there may also be some uncomfortable experiences, and that's the point that's raised there, even in the encounter piece, that you may not um, you may be. Uh, disturbed, for example, sometimes a person has expressed to me during this conference, during this whole controversy, that they're disturbed by seeing um, someone sitting on the sidewalk uh, holding a sign. They might consider that disturbing. It, it's the intent of this to say that yes, to validate that that is the experience, that many people are disturbed by certain sights that they see. However, um, I think that. The purpose of this resolution is to state that those should be accommodated rather than what many other cities and towns have done, which is um, regulate them such that the time, manner, and place uh, so limited their activities to make them non-existent and, non and essentially invisible. So again, I think that cutting out those two sections of the essential elements of sidewalks um, uh, defeats the entire purpose of the resolution. I think some of this is semantic, but I think it's actually important. There's a difference between, you used some words I agree with, the words disturbing, unpopular, and uncomfortable. I would re put all three of those words in, which is different than disruptive. And just one thing on the civil rights movement, specifically the civil rights movement, were doing actions to change current law, right? They were doing disruptive actions specifically to change the law. Well, if people want to take certain actions that are disruptive to change other laws downtown, fine. But I think the essence here is what you just said. You said it in your words. I was just quite disturbing, unpopular, and uncomfortable. I would put all three of those words in. It's enjoyable, and some might be disturbing, uncomfortable, or unpopular activities. And I'd be fine with that, and I think it still keeps with the core of what you're saying there. Uh, just to follow up with the counselor one more time, the one other definition in, of, uh, if you remember in um, disruptive, it's also referring to things that disruptive is in the eye of the beholder in many ways. Many people would consider the sidewalk sales quite disruptive. Mm -hmm. However, 
I think that we ought to tolerate them. We ought to tolerate them as a piece of commerce, as, as an essential part of a vibrant city that has economic activities and that, you know, many people complain that they're inconvenienced by having to step aside and the crowds of the sidewalk sales, but none of us would consider wanting to eliminate those because some consider them disruptive. And so that's why, you know, I think it's important to keep that word in there in the sense that, yes, disruptive is, is in the sense in the eye of the beholder or in the, in the heart of the person who is disturbed. I hear you, but I still think it keeps the heart of what you're saying. But uh, I would vote for the amendment with these changes. Um, just a few things. The reason why I think, and and I appreciate the points. I, the reason why I think this, the language disruptive is is um, is appropriate is because I, I when I think of that, I think of many things. But I also think of, of people that we frequently see downtown downtown um, having mental health issues um, and causing alarm to some people but i think we have to share downtown people who have mental health issues who are in the process of having a mental health breakdown um, people who have substance abuse issues um, victims of crime some people have criminal records um, th there are all sorts of people downtown and that's why i appreciate this this resolution and i support it um, with respect to disorderly conduct um, disorderly conduct and and I don't, I don't think this is, this is to encourage disorderly conduct, but I do, but also I've actually just, just for clarification, I've, I've, I, I deal with this charge frequently because in my work and disorderly conduct is not just someone acting out. That, that's not what it is. The, the Massachusetts model jury instructions say that um, when a person, and this is a summary, but person has to engage in fighting or fighting or threatening behavior. And certainly we don't mean to encourage that. And frankly, I think police, police get this wrong all the time. It's not just acting out. That alone is not disorderly conduct. You have to be in, engaging in fighting or threatening behavior or in a violent or tumultuous behavior or creating a hazardous or physically offensive condition. I don't think the intent of this resolution is to create any of that. And also, um, it's, they also have to prove that someone is doing this intentionally. So for the person who's having a mental health breakdown and maybe is saying some offensive things, there's, even that person is not necessarily um, engaging in disorderly conduct. And there are other ways to deal with them. People should call the cops on them because they should be sectioned appropriately to deal with the mental health issues. But I, I believe that this is just a, a general resolution. It, the, the greater point is, is, is about inclusion and it's about in social, social justice. And I think that we need sidewalks that don't lead just to businesses, but also to social justice. Thank you. Um, if I can expand on this as one of the sponsors, the, the items that you're recommending to remove actually are part of the definitions phase of this. And in fact, if you take out the definitions, you essentially remove the essence of it. And the essence, of course, is to expand the conversation that, as Councilor Carney referred to. The, originally this resolution, Council Carney was inspired to write this resolution that was going to be partnered with an ordinance, if you'll recall, and the ordinance was withdrawn. But the fact is, is that we had an, an opportunity that was recognized, and this is the mayor recognizes, the council recognizes, uh, people on Facebook recognize it. So there you know, that's the imprimatur that exceeds all others. But the, the fact is that there was a, there was Clear, there is a point of conflict that comes from living in a and functioning in a public space, and unfortunately, a lot of this discussion was divided on those people and these people, ignoring the fact that we were talking in every instance about the public. Every sentient human being who congregates downtown is the public, and we sometimes cast aspersions. There were people who were casting aspersions on business owners that were wholly unfair, there were, and, and vice versa, on people who were uh, downtown uh, or representing people who were downtown, who habituate downtown as being some other type of scurrilous type of person. And what happened was we lost sight of the fact that we were talking about the public. And the essence of this, and I think the essence to which you all seem to agree, is to expand and to talk about the discussion about expanding and improving the public commons, the place where the public can congregate. And I think it's critical that we don't go into this with a certain naivete, that it's not all just flowery language. I think it's important, the distinctions that Councilor Carney has, has written in and that Councilor Adams referred to, 
this disruptive behavior is the genesis of the conflict in some levels, or at least the perception of genesis uh, of, of, of conflict. And conflict actually, this says, in its essence, is part of the price of transactions with human beings. <clears throat> It's when we congregate in public, we abrade, we bump against each other, we, we have fights, we have disagreements, we, we have unpleasant experiences, on top of which, but the fact is what trumps all of that is, it tra what transcends all that is, it is the very essence expression of a public, of a community that struggles with these issues on a daily basis. And the more that we try to hide it or obscure it or, or engineer it, the more trouble we ultimately get into because we're missing the more, most cogent point of the whole conversation. And so the hope here is that, and, I, and I, I personally advocate for keeping these fact, these, these uh, points in here. I do, I have actually been in consultation with the police chief about the concerns that Council Murphy brought up. He actually recommends simply uh, a, a one-line amendment at the, in the last, therefore, be it resolved, changing enjoyable and disruptive activities to active and passive, which, while keeping these points of definition in, in the center, uh, speaks rather clearly about what we're talking about here, and at the same time would might address some of his concerns as far as uh, 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 prosecution of people who actually do, or in fact, step across the line and violate the law. Uh, Councilor, uh, actually, Councilor Freeman Daniels hasn't spoken at this point yet, and then Councilor Daisy. To the amendment, um, I don't really think it's necessary because we have um, the actual resolution says that uh, the council envisions sidewalks that can accommodate. So I, I actually don't think that it's uh, very, um, I think it's a uh, future looking hypothetical, uh, and I don't think it would have much. Uh, applicability in a legal context. So I think uh, just, I think it's unnecessary. Councilor Tacey. Yeah. Might it odd too that the chief would take disruptive out of one paragraph and not the other. I, I, I would love it, I think, uh, and I don't care if somebody's sleeping on the courthouse lawn or if they're sleeping in Pulaski Park or if they're sleeping and not sleeping on a bench. That's, so sleep wherever you want, but the benches are there for sitting and for I, I think for merchants and things such as that but that's just my opinion but if it said something like even talking loudly uh, period not period but comma uh, or violate social just remove disruptive I would love that I, and I, I, I can't understand why the chief would take disruptive out of no therefore be it resolved and leave it in the whereas Else speak to that? I, well, I can speak to that on some level because the, 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 what's being resolved, there's you have the definitions with the whereases, which actually defines the concern, and then the resolve is the language which bears the weight. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm, I appreciate uh, Councillor Adams uh, looking up the uh, definitions and really clarifying what is to be considered disorderly conduct because I think that's what the concern is. I think the concern at the public safety level or the police level is whether they'll be able to enforce uh, disorderly conduct and other, um, you know, really serious problems. And, um, and so I don't think that those that are mentioned here in the resolution in any way impede the law enforcement from addressing those issues. Uh, I know that there's a there's a um, suspicion that they might, but even as Councilor Freeman Daniels said, this is a visionary s resolution. This is one that speaks to how we see the use of public space. And so again, I would consider each of those amendments kind of cutting to the essence of this resolution, and I would be sorry to see them adopted. This is on the amendments. You want to vote on the amendment, uh, Councilor Murphy? I would, uh, I would be tempted to also ask Councilor Adams to look up the definition of disturbing the peace. But the way this is going, I don't think we need to take the time to do that. I'm sorry. 
Can you restate your uh, your amendment? Oh, just that we remove confrontation, survival, and strike envision sidewalks as spaces that can accommodate both enjoyable and disruptive activities from the resolution. So that's the amendment, and we'll vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Opposed? No. 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 I was an eye, by the way. It was mine. That's what I figured I was saying. Two, uh, two eyes, and the rest were no. Uh, now back to the motion. I just, I can just address that. It's um, disturbing the peace is un unreasonably disruptive, such as um, tumultuous or offensive conduct. That's some of the things that, that are listed. Hurling objects in a populated area, uh, threatening, quarreling, fighting, challenging others, uttering personal insults. So, you know, I, I, again, I don't think that this resolution is in fight of tumultuous or, or offensive conduct, hurling objects or or most of the things that are listed in, in there. Unreasonably disruptive. And who on the street is going to define unreasonable? Police. I mean, they're, they're, they're the ones who do charge under this. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, just want to reiterate my earlier comment, which is that um, this is a, a hypothetical future looking. Um, a potential uh, uh, res resolution that uh, does not uh, bind the city to uh, immediate um, uh, suffrage of, of enjoyable or disruptive activities on our sidewalks. One more final thought. And just to give context to this, we're out of that time. I mean, time moves quickly here, and we're on to the next controversy. Mm -hmm. So this was, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, a good month and a half ago that this was, was drafted. Um, and so therefore, there's the reference, the numerous reference to benches. And I'll let people know I pulled out the final reference in the um, therefore be it resolved to ask for the benches to be reinstalled, because the mayor, in his infinite wisdom, uh, heard um, from the community that it was wise to, to uh, restore those benches. But really, I think that this was done as a way for the council to uh, have a say, to speak, speak to that issue more formally. It would have been at that time, but if you recall, our meeting was almost at midnight, mm -hmm. and we decided that this should happen at the following meeting. So <clears throat> that's why we are now six weeks out of the issue. And, just to give that context. <laughs> and to reinforce that, the discussion that I had with the counselor was the, the frequent frustration we, we experience when these issues are flaming white hot and um, there is thoughtful conversations tend not to survive that heat. And our hope, what, and what happens is once the issue abates and the cameras move away and the stories stop being written, that the conversations stop. And that, and there's two things. We want to reinforce the fact this has been an ongoing conflict, and this did just spring up this summer. <laughs> this this happens every summer, and these issues are ever present. And the fact that the community and the city, from when I first was elected, uh, a very very long time ago, um, we were discussing these very issues, different principles, different people, sometimes slightly different circumstances but the fact is is that this is ongoing and it might there might not be a resolution that can be so convenient as moving some benches but the fact is that we did want to continue and expand the conversation promote the conversation to expand and increase public space and public opportunity um, we I, I'll speak for myself in this case that that actually benefits everyone, including businesses, including people who are at risk, including everybody else. There's the more people downtown, the reason we are an attractive place to live, move to, shop at, panhandle in, is because we have human beings <laughs> congregating downtown. And the more we can promote that, the better we will all be for it. I'm, I'm confident of that, and I certainly hope that the resolution isn't the end of the conversation. The hope of this resolution was to promote the conversation. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, I don't want to steal uh, Councilor Specter's thunder, Please but uh, <laughs> uh, 
the uh, Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use Committee has uh, started uh, some in-depth discussions about the uh, vitality and vibrancy of our downtown. And uh, we'll be, con I think, continuing to, uh, to look into the issue uh, in, a, in more concrete uh, ways uh, over the summer and fall. Was we just, no, no. Okay. Um, let me just add to that that, in fact, we're going to try and, in conjunction with you, to put together through Edlu some public sessions as well uh, in the fall and we to discuss this issue. So. Any other discussion <coughs> on the resolution as proposed? Uh, what's the council's preference here? Just a voice vote? Roll call. There's a roll call. Yes. Council yes. Council Casey? No. Council Adams? Yes. Council Carney? Yes. Council Dwight? Yes. Council Yes. Yes. To the spirit and intent, yes. To the text of the resolution, no. Well, it's got to be one or the other. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, I it comes down to no, then. To no. Two no's, seven yes. The, the resolution passes. First reading, and we will revisit this at our next meeting. Does it come up on the 27th? Okay. Yeah. Week from today. This is a resolution uh, upon the recommendation of the Northampton Youth Commission, a resolution in support of regulating high capacity weapons. Whereas the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution protects an individual's right to own weapons, but does not preclude the regulation and promotion of responsible ownership and possession, and whereas the technology of weaponry available to the public is advanced to include guns capable of meeting out vast indiscriminate death and injury, and whereas absent laws requiring universal qualification or background investigation, dangerous people are able to acquire these weapons and inflict horrible wanton trauma to communities. and. Whereas the Youth Commission of Northampton has organized and expressed their profound concern for the future and well-being of their city and home and have petitioned the Northampton City Council to call for sensible gun control measures that include universal background checks, a ban on weapons defined as assault weapons, and a limitation on the capacity of ammunition magazines. And whereas over 250 Northampton residents between the ages of 13 and 18 signed a petition calling for a resolution by this Northampton City Council to express an appeal, express the appeal and support for the gun control measures proposed by President Barack Obama. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council supports the call of its younger citizens for the reasonable and effective gun control measures proposed by the President of the United uh, the President to be reintroduced to the Congress in advance for a vote and to be ratified with deliberate speed, and there and be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council calls upon President Barack Obama, Senator, Liz Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator William Cowan, and Congressman James McGovern to consider the concern expressed by Northampton's youth as they pursue the, these protections with urgency, diligence, and determination. Be it further resolved that copies of this resolution shall be sent to President Barack Obama, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator William Cowan, and Congressman James McGovern. I'll accept the motion to put it on the floor. So moved. Second. <coughs> Um, I suppose I, I should represent this the, uh, and the liaison to the Northampton Youth Commission. And uh, as you recall, um, we, uh, I think it was two council meetings ago, we received a petition from that the uh, Northampton Youth Commission was inspired to pass out among their cohort, generated by the very real and genuine concern of the, the, the murders at uh, Sandy Hook, of course, and then, short, uh, you know, right on the heels of that, there was a lockdown at the high school, and there was also some concern at the middle school. Um, and the Northampton Youth Commission, actually, which was working on other projects at the time, felt that this should take precedent. That it was, it was. We frequently have these conversations absent the children that we could, we frequently pretend to represent, or we actually aspire to represent. I don't want to besmirch our, our intent. But the fact is that they had some concerns that they felt that they should express clearly and themselves to us. And I actually feel that uh, given their charge, first of all, I agree with the t intent, but I also um, 
want to honor the motivation and and the concern that's expressed in the in the proposed resolution. Any other discussion? We're going to let it stand at that. Huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor of the resolution? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. That's a, that's it's a, a no. No? You're voting no. no. Yes. Opposing the resolution. Yep. Okay. Uh, any abstentions? And I'm not a gun owner. I want to let no. everybody know that. Uh, okay, the resolution passes. Uh, another resolution, and this is uh, <coughs> upon the recommendation of uh, City Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels. This is a resolution calling for justice in Guantanamo Bay. Or is the practice of holding people in the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base Detention Center, hereafter referred to as Guantanamo Bay Detention Center? represents continuation of the repudiated foreign policy and stain upon the character of the United States. And whereas over 100 of the 166 remaining presidents, uh, res prisoners at Guantanamo Bay Detention Center have been on a hunger strike for over 98 days to protest the lack of basic human and legal rights as outlined by the U.S. Constitution and international law. And whereas 86 prisoners have been cleared for release since 2010 by an interagency task force yet continue to be detained. And whereas it is wrong for any country, for any reason, to detain someone for over 11 years and not charge him with any crime, and whereas the United States have declared that the continued imprisonment of the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center prisoners is, quote, a flagrant violation of international human rights law and in itself constitutes a form of cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, close quote. And whereas the United Nations condemned the coercive practice of force feeding of hunger striking prisoners of the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center as a form of torture and a violation of medical ethics, and whereas residents of Northampton have long struggled to close the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center from the activism of no more Guantanamos to hunger striking residents to acts of civil disobedience to a Northampton proclamation denouncing the torturous conditions of Guantanamo on June 22, 2011. And whereas other municipalities from ne the nearby town of Amherst to the city of Berkeley have acted forthrightly to address the injustices at Guantanamo Bay by offering to accepted clear prisoners in their communities. And whereas the president, as, whereas President Obama pledged to close the prison over five years ago and recently stated that the prison is, quote, not necessary to keep America safe, it's expensive, it's inefficient, it hurts us in terms of international standings. It lessens cooperation with our allies in the counterterrorism efforts, close quote. And therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council calls upon the federal representative and senators to advocate and act forthrightly to see justice done in Guantanamo Bay. And be it, for, be it resolved, we call upon the president, on President Obama to maintain his pledge to close the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center and be it resolved that the Northampton, the city of Northampton opposes the continued existence of the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center and the violation of the rule of law that it represents and calls for all its prisoners to be charged or released. And be it further resolved that copies of this resolution <coughs> will be sent to the President and the Attorney General of the United States, the United States Senators from Massachusetts, and the United States Representative from Massachusetts Second District. I have a motion put it on the floor. So moved. Second. Discussion? I just want to add one small historical piece to this. If you remember <clears throat> back to the 2008 election of when John McCain and Barack Obama were both were running, both of them spoke at that time to the closing of Guantanamo. It was unanimous. No one was speaking in favor of keeping Guantanamo at that time. And you had generals speaking against it. It was only when Barack Obama was elected that you had people who anything he did had a knee-jerk reaction. Whatever he proposes, we have to be against. So, we did have a period, a very short period, where everybody said, this is an abomination, we have to close it. I um, want to thank uh, Jeff and Paul Tano and the, Ameri the AF American Friends Service Committee for um, helping me with this. And um, it's the least I can do. Council of Arch. I support this. Um, you're looking at, this is so inhuman. 
of what is occurring here with the type of treatment that these people are going through. I find it to be a civil rights issue. It, it's, it's just unheard of. And to force feed people and so forth and treat them so cruel is inhuman. And I'm gonna support this because I think that they should open the doors and get them out of there. Uh, Councilor Tacey, do you have your hand up? <clears throat> yeah. And remember, the promises uh, also was gonna close it in 12 months. And here we are now, how many years later? Um, it's still open. There must be, somebody must have some reason that we don't know why it's still open. I am not privy to, I mean, why it is still operating. I'm not privy to that, I don't know. I feel very safe walking down the streets of Northampton. I feel less safe than I do since the Boston Marathon. But I still feel relatively safe. And part of my reason for voting no on the, the resolution before this are we going to have everybody that does canning or anything in their houses or whatever, or are we going to register our pressure cookers? Are we not? Are we going to have to have a license to buy a piece of pipe? I mean, where, it does, where does it end? I feel extremely safe, and I, I'm not going to second guess why Guantanamo Bay is still open or why those particular prisoners are still there, because I don't know. I absolutely do not know. So I, I will have to vote no on this. As I voted no on the other, I, I don't know where it will end, but I know the atrocities that have been committed around the world. And some people have been detained. I, 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 don't, know, I don't know why, I just, I, I don't have a clue. It's not, it's above my pay grade to know this. But if Barack Obama and John McCain, especially Barack Obama, I remember him He's going to close Guantanamo Bay, mm -hmm. I promise, in 12 months. How many years has it been? <clears throat> it's, still, it's still open, people are still detained, and there must be a reason. That's my opinion. Right. I hear that point. My concern is if de these detainees are so dangerous, why haven't they been charged? Aside from the inhumane cheap treatment, if they're so dangerous, why haven't they been charging some people for 11 years? I mean, obviously, we don't have the evidence. We're holding people, and we don't have the evidence. That's my concern. And I support this res resolution 100%, and I thank the sponsor. Councilor Schwartz and Councilor Kahn. Yeah, I just want to add my heartfelt and urgent sense of support around this, and thank you to Councilor Freeman Daniels and the other uh, advocates in our community. Thank you very much. Um, I just think it is a travesty that this has gone on for as long as it has, and I'm just ashamed, deeply ashamed by it. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to lend our voice as a community to having this stop. Councilor Carmen. And I also want to uh, echo the gratitude to Councilor Freeman Daniels for uh, working with the American Friends and drafting this. Um, I know that oftentimes we've uh, tried to decide whether or not we actually should speak to national issues like this, but this is a very important one, even though what we resolve here is not something that will change. At least it speaks to what I believe is the general consensus in, in this community. And um, because of what, because especially the uh, things that Councillor Adams referenced, the detention for so many years with no charge speaks so directly um, uh, against what we hold as fundamental and dear principles, our Bill of Rights. And so um, given that uh, it's, it's un-American, and so I'm uh, gonna, gonna support this also. Thank you. Also, the um, short answer to why is actually, it's a political issue. The Congress actually has subverted the closing Guantanamo for a variety of reasons, You'll have to speculate on that. The issue of our pay grade concerns me because this is our pay grade. I, mean, I think that we take an oath to defend the Constitution. And by my reckoning, the Constitution, Guantanamo, is at risk, has been at risk, has stood at risk, because what we have done 
is we have taken away the writ of habeas corpus. We do not, we do not imprison people without charging them. We do not imprison people, with, well, at least on paper, we do not imprison people without charges or a right to represent themselves <coughs> in a court of law. We don't do that. Everything that we supposedly, we are, the, the, everything we're supposed to do is to defend the Constitution. And in fact, almost every issue that we're talking about resolution-wise in the several resolutions that we're discussing are to that point. It is, this has been, this was established as an obscenity, it is maintained as an obscenity, and I cannot feel in good conscience that I can continue to apologize for an obscenity being spoken in my name. And I will have, I will vote for this in the dire hope that it actually is one small, tiny note from a little blue speck in a little blue state to somebody who might be paying attention that we actually do take our oath very seriously to protect the Constitution. Um, any other <coughs> discussion on the motion? Uh, Councilor Tacey. Yeah, I do take the oath very seriously, and I really don't know why they are detained. I haven't got a clue. I just don't know, and I'm not comfortable voting for something that I don't know anything about. No, understood. Uh, Councilor Jim Dams, no? Councilor Adams? No, I was going to request a roll call for this voting time. Uh, so voice votes of preference? Roll call. Roll call. There is a call for a roll. No. Yes. 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 Motion passes. The resolution passes. We will come up for a second reading at uh, the next council meeting a week from today, or hours away. Uh, the, why don't we we take a brief uh, recess before we jump into uh, the budget? meeting such as it is actually uh, we passed up one minute announcements um, there's an opportunity now council the barge um, we all got an email um, from the North Haven Recreation Department that they have approximately 100 to 200 yards of excess tailings from construction at the Florence Recreation Fields on Spring Street Florence they are offering it to the first party interested First come, first serve basis for free. You must load and truck the material out, and you must take all of the material. The material must be taken out within a few days of the agreement. Interested parties should call the Recreation Department at 587-1040. The material we're talking about, the tailings are dirt, I hope? The soil. <laughs> dirt. Soil, okay. Well, Just to be tailings. clear. Well, tailings can be any number of horrible that's things. What? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Uh, Councilor Tacey. Yes, uh, and the tailings are already gone today. So that's moved. They've been cleaned up. They're ready to move forward. There's still a fill pile left. Uh, the place is looking great. It's exciting, very exciting. My brother did. Who did? My brother did. He did? Yep. Any other announcements? All right. Um, we're going to recess and go into finance, and I'm passing the gavel to the Chair of Finance, Councilor Murphy. Chair, can you call the roll for finance? Murphy. Here. 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 Present. Here. So we have uh, four financial orders, and the first one is regards to a taking uh, order for a portion of Graves Avenue. Do you want me to read it all here rather than in the... I might as well rather than here. meeting. And everybody has an email in their packets, even if you're not on finance. You got an email from Mr. Huntley that talks about this. 
So I'll read it here. We'll give Council President a break. Uh, whereas a petition has been duly filed to the layout and accept, to accept a portion of Graves Avenue as a public way, and the petition has been referred to the Planning Board and the Board of Public Works, and the Board of Public Works has held a duly noticed public hearing on petition to lay out and accept the public way, and both the Planning Board and the Board of Public Works have recommended laying out and accepting such portion of Graves Avenue as a public way. Now, therefore, be it be ordered that the City Council authorizes the acquisition by gift purchase eminent domain or otherwise an easement in and over a parcel of land shown as Graves Avenue layout 40 foot wide area of roadway to be accepted 3,182 square feet of the plan entitled Street Acceptance Plan of Land in Northampton Mass dated May 24 2013 prepared for the City of Northampton by Heritage Surveys Inc College Highway Southampton Massachusetts for the purpose of laying out establishing establishing and accepting public way thereon. Further, that the City Council hereby lays out, establishes, and accepts a public way uh, of the parcel taken herein, and further, that no damages shall be payable as a result of the taking herein, and no betterment shall be assessed as a result of the laying out, establishing, or accepting the public way. Move to recommend. Second. Okay. Any discussion in finance? Yes, Council Uva. I think we heard the resident speak in the open public session of him agreeing to this, being um, part of the landowner, and also correcting the, um, the drainage problem that they're having in that site. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? I, I would just like to ask Councilor Freeman Daniels if he can update us um, on the- Four, three. Four, three. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this, so far as I can tell, is the first acceptance of a private way into a public way that uh, the Board of Public Works has been uh, working on. Um, the, the, one of the first of the recent group, other than, of course, uh, um, the, one in, the one in Florence that we did a few months ago and so on. But uh, the, this piece, at the end of Graves was long considered to be public. Um, it was, I think, surp a surprise to many that it wasn't. Um, they've been receiving city services on that strip. And uh, without this, um, without making this public, uh, it will be difficult for the um, Department of Public Works to uh, affect the um, new drainage line. But uh, the thing that, um, that bothers me, and I think the thing that really is uh, out of keeping with, uh, with the, um, the spirit of this, uh, this um, acceptance is the comments from the uh, planning board, which said that they recommend the street segment be accepted, but they also have a strong recommendation that a public path be included that would connect the end of Graves to Bridge Street School. Now, this is something that the council has already had already talked about earlier in the year, had already um, tabled indefinitely with the intent that it will die at the end of this session. Um, there's continues to be no uh, good study or um, fact-based pattern that would suggest that um, this private the private space beyond this um, roadway uh, should indeed connect Graves, the back of Graves Avenue to Bridge Street School, and that and it would be a, a hostile taking um, if if or a a, a non an unfriendly non friendly. I don't think the hostile is the right term for it, and it would be an unfriendly taking. Um, so here, the planning board apparently um, continues to uh, push without. Um, any kind of a study or, um, or really any good reason to to ask the city council to do an unfriendly taking, and I think that's um, r rather inappropriate. Uh, and uh, this is what the Graves Avenue residents are um, upset about, and they should be. Um, so uh, that um, th those are my comments. Um, I'm I'm gratified to see that uh, this was not what the board of public works is proposing, and this is not what the vote is about is not about taking a strip of land that uh, is connecting, that is essentially ends 
a very dense dead end street and makes it into a throughway. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just to that point that uh, I want to emphasize that this does not include that recommendation from the planning board that we are only authorizing the uh, easement arrangement that was negotiated with with the uh, abutters and the residents on Graves Avenue and with the express and explicit purpose of just addressing the drainage and there is no <coughs> granting by by if we approve this there is no granting and there shouldn't be any presumed granting of any other access or easement uh, associated with this property despite the fact that the planning board thinks it, that's their brothers mm -hmm. i do want to reassure everybody that we're talking about just under 80 feet of paved surface that anyone in their right mind would think is already part of graves avenue you know it's everybody thought it was street it looks like street it's used as street it just wasn't on the books so we're going to add it it's not any no 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 new asphalt will be laid it's all existing turf down there that people think is the street now any other comment in councilor Tayson? is there a fence here not on this between the bridge between school. the school and the end of the graves avenue so it will be wide open is it I'm not sure if I understand your question. There is a fence that limits the back of the uh, Jeswald property to the school, but there's a, um, a break in the fence that used to have a gate and now no longer has a gate. Um, that, uh, so there, it's, it's possible to walk from one section to the, of the, school, the back end of the school to that street, but it's not a public uh, way. And uh, just pursuant to the conversation we had earlier this or, uh, yeah I guess it was late last year um, that is um, a conversation that may eventually be had by a future council but uh, it's it really will dramatically change the the character of Graves Avenue and I think it needs to be done with uh, much more information and, and a significant study than what's proposed tonight that's right so so there is no gate there there is no provision to stop the use of the right of way no and this is and what we're voting on here is part of what looks like the street today it's nowhere near the fence or the hole or any of that oh, this I've is, seen it I, I was there I walked this it. is the street councilor Barsh did you have a question no I, I Carolyn Mitch is here maybe we should bring her forth I'd like to this, make is, that a this is a DPW yeah, question. she's shaking her know. head. This I've is been hearing about the planning board and so forth. Well, the planning board made a recommendation, but w it's not part of this at all, and it's just it was part of the recommendation of their approval of the street acceptance. But it's, I mean, there may be, I think there may be an appropriate time to actually talk to the planning board about this. But and Carolyn Mish is not the planning board, <laughs> so I understand that, and I did not ask that. So, any other questions on this one? then uh, it's been moved and seconded all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed thank you swap that for the motion and this is a financial order these are budgetary transfers to close out uh, fiscal year 2013 and these are transfers basically uh, within departments and would you like it? You all see them as a whole list of them. They total $203 or $203,430. Is it your pleasure to read them all out? <laughs> um, I, I move. I'm going to say it'd be a little necessary. Yeah. Well, I, I move that we waive the reading. Waive the reading. All right. And again, these are all existing dollars being transferred around the balance of books off for the end of fiscal 13. Um, any questions about these? Do I have a motion to approve them or recommend them to council? I recommend it to full city council. Right. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. These are like Any street vote? sweepings. Yeah. And we do, uh, Councilor LaBarge, we do get to deal with some dirt or the money from the dirt. The soil. <laughs> the next <laughs> soil, yeah. Soil. 
the next is a financial order to appropriate um, $5,272.50 from the FY13 general fund undesignated balance or free cash to fund improvements at the Florence Fields. And this is to, we, we sold um, some dirt. And these are the proceeds from the dirt sale, and we're just taking that money from the general fund and letting them use it for Florence Fields. Whereas excess soil removed during the development of the Florence Fields recreation area was deemed unusable for the project by the project manager D and DPW, whereas the disposition of the excess soil was competitively bid and sold, whereas the funds received for the soil was $5,272.50 and it was deposited in the general fund, whereas as it is the desire of the recreation commission and rec department to use the funds for the continued development of Florence Fields recreation area. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the $5,272.50 be appropriated from the FY13 general fund undesignated fund balance to fund improvements at the Florence Fields recreation area. To approve. Uh, second. Second. All right. Discussion. Councilor Tacey, I believe that was that this big pile of dirt that everybody wondered about that. Yes. It got Huge. sold and accounted for. It's gone. It's gone. It was a public bidding process. Uh, um, the it was the uh, bid was awarded to Duffy Willard, um, and it was. I think it was a buck and a half a yard. And they bought it and took it away. They bought it and took it away. It's done. Mm -hmm. And they left tailings. <laughs> Stuff that nobody wanted and it's gone. <laughs> so and, uh, any, was, right? any other questions about this one? It's pre this pretty straightforward. And again, the place is looking great. Okay. All right. Um, so we had a motion? Correct. Yes. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And then this is a real historical one. We're going back to 2012 now. We had a bill that lingered and didn't get paid in 2012, and it's almost 2014, and now we have to authorize it. So the City Council authorizes payment of $198 for two bills from prior fiscal year, that would be fiscal year 12, uh, to general code publishers to meet that obligation and approve a budgetary transfer from the FY13 workers' compensation account to the FY13 MIS professional and technical service account. So um, general code publishers are the people that put our ordinances online, and evidently there was a bill from fiscal year 12 that didn't get paid in fiscal year 12, and we'd Move like to, to clear it up. So motion? Second. Move Second. Move. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And Are two that on that? We don't do that in finance. No, this is finance. Sorry. It's Sorry. only finance. It will come up in, in the yep. regular meeting. So uh, with nothing else on the agenda, a motion to close finance. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Well, we're back and convening. <laughs> we are, we are mm. now up to the financial orders. In the first reading, this is. Um, now, I'm not sure what the council's pleasure is here. We have uh, 37 items financial orders actually there's um, if 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 I beg the council's indulgence we have someone here from Graves Avenue who's he still here he's still gone okay mm -hmm. I guess he felt comfortable with the discussion in, in finance it so might be it might be wise to just clear 34 to 37 out anyway so we can that's not a bad discussion idea. 34 and 37 are not directly related to, to the budget so there's a request for two readings on financial order of taking the portion of Graves Avenue is a, there was a request for two readings. I'll accept the motion to put it on the I'll floor. Move it in first reading. Second. Any further discussion? Sorry. Sorry. We'll let Mary catch up. Catch up. It's not fair. Uh, I need to give some time to get our packets up. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. This is uh, item number 34 under the financial orders. We're just moving it up before we get to address the budget. Um, and this is the financial order, the order of taking the portion of Graves Avenue that was just discussed in Finance Committee uh, to secure that end of Graves Avenue. And the motion's been made, seconded. Any further discussion? Suspend Rule 14. Oh, we, gotta, we have to vote on We've got to roll call. We've got to do the roll call first on this. So, so. Council Adams? Yes. Council Carney? Yes. Council Dwight? Yes. 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 
Now, Councilor. There's been a motion to suspend Rule 14. Is there a second? Second. And a second. Any discussion on the suspension rules? Councilor Freeman Davis. The uh, de Department of Public Works under the Central Services Department wants to uh, start the work, I believe, in uh, about five days. So it's important that they are they have this. Uh, Right. Well, it's, it's, it's important. That, actually, no. This is a. T this is the, the take, making the yes, public right. a street. So it's important that they are able to walk and make improvement to a public way. In being in your ward, are you familiar with any? Or is there huge water problems in this? All this deluge as we've had. We'll get to that. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll take that. <laughs> So I need a motion. We're, at, we're still on the rules. Well, so we haven't voted on the on those suspension rules. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Second, reading. second readings moved. Second. There's a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Ah, Aye. Sorry. Aye. Roll call. <coughs> yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Aye. Yes. Renegades. <laughs> um, this is uh, financial order. This is number 35 in your hymnal. Uh, this is the budgetary transfers of $203,430. The first reading. I'll accept them. Second it. All right. Any discussion? Further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 All right. Um, you want to do the next two? Is it? Yeah. I'd move the appropriation of the five thousand dollars for the dirt at the Florence Fields because that's not budgeted. Either. Right. Second. There's a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. Yes. 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 Uh, I'd also like to move the number thirty-seven, the hundred and ninety-eight dollars from two thousand twelve. Second. Uh, there's a motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Aye. There's been a request for two readings. Yes. Suspend yes. rule suspend rule 14. Rule 14. There's a motion and a second for the suspension of rules. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. Aye. Second reading. Second reading is moved. Second. All those, uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay. We have two minutes left of the second quarter. Fifteen tens for the rough. Fifteen. Fifteen. How that you're paying attention. <laughs> Following every word you say. Right, okay, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, let's get to it. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. This is the first reading. This is, yes, Council Murphy. So I would like to move item number one, the general fund budget of $67,038,720. Just the main. Just the main. The general fund budget. And uh, was the Council's pleasure that I read the, uh, the order? I'll second the motion. Okay. I will read the order here. It's uh, this is upon the recommendation of the mayor, the sum of $76,038,720, which is the full amount necessary for fiscal year 2014 general fund budget, which runs from July 1st, 2013 to June 30th, 2014, be appropriated for the purposes stated. To meet this appropriation, $1,728,110 will be raised and appropriated from parking meter receipts reserved 
$25,000 from Cemetery Perpetual Care Trust Fund, $10,000 from the cemetery sale of lots receipts <coughs> reserved, $1,713,905 from the sewer enterprise funds, $855,531 from the water enterprise funds, $97,547 from the solid waste enterprise funds, $6,000 from wetlands filing, filing fees, $3,000 from the waterways fund, $12,145 from the Community Preservation Act administrative funds, $160,000 from Comcast INET reserve fund, $145,000 from energy rebates, $34,154 from reserve for police station debt service, and $71,248,328 will be raised and appropriated. Move to approve. I believe it's been, uh, the yeah, motion's it's been already been made and it's on the floor. Uh, the mayor and Susan Wright are here. Um, the floor is open for discussion. <laughs> Jeez. Um, mayor, do you have anything to add in, uh, in, in the days looming now before the approval? Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, it, it should be noted the quiet that everyone's experiencing is the fact that, that we have now been discussing every nuance and every detail of this budget for some time. And the facts, such as they are, lay before us. But if you want to speak to at least in brief. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> These are the kind of the, the orders which kind of carry out the stuff we've been talking about that, that make all the various appropriations. Um, and again, this is the this is the uh, you know, proposed uh, budget. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a vote on Tuesday, so these orders may change. We may bring amendments to them at your scheduled meeting next week. Um, but this is to this is this is what it will take to put together uh, the package that you have in front of you. So, I so this budget that we are voting on tonight represents all the cuts under the existing circumstances of the 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 revenue available to us. That is correct. That is correct. Uh, Councilor Kern. Well, just to, uh, to point out that the hearings that we've had really focused on the appropriations piece for each of the departments. Um, and so what this clarifies is where the income, the revenue piece, mm -hmm. where that comes from. And so these are estimates, I take it. Some, of, I mean, for example, the uh, um, cemetery sale of lots and things like that, those are not cast in stone, what we're so to speak. <laughs> Those are the revenues that we, we, we already have. Oh, uh, we are. OK. We're, we're so it's not projected. Case. Those are yeah. what we have in the fund. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the budget, I, the school uh, department, we're going to raise $50 million in, in taxes in this uh, this budget and the school takes about two-thirds of that that money in everything that includes retirements it includes whatever that the city picks up it's an enormous amount of money and I had proposed or I'd like I'd like to see a zero based budget for the school. I'd like to see them take the school budget. This is the biggest part of the city's budget. It's absolutely enormous and it's pretty difficult to plot through this and, and figure it out and figure out what's what's there, what's needed, what's not needed, what's extra, what's fluff, what might whatever it is. The the overrides are you know, this is all about education. If I proposed a zero based budget at one time and uh, was uh, during the Higgins administration and her answer to me was zero zero based budgeting is a tool that is used by businesses and does not necessarily work for government she said that right here uh, at this meeting and then she also said on the radio the following morning when she was on the radio and then Governor Deval Patrick said the following day I heard it on the radio he said that he's initiating a zero based budget um, for the state and 
as we go through year after year after year after year, and we look at all of the budgets, every department, and I, I say the schools because it's the biggest one. If we were to take the school department budget right down to zero and take what the state requires us to provide and take it seriously, start up with transportation, getting kids to school, and then put together a package, what is required by the state for us to do in our school system and put all of the requirements together and then look at the amount of money that we have and then figure out just exactly what extra stuff do we want to put in there. What else can we put in that is not required by the state? Bring it back down, bring it down to zero and start right from the very bottom. And I think, I believe that if we did that, we would find I mean, we've got to be able to find 2% or 1% in a budget that is lapsed at $40 million total. There's got to be something in there. Bring it down to zero, start at the bottom, take what the state wants to give you, because if you don't, we may be providing things or, or whatever it may be, at the cost of disenfranchising elderly, disabled, single moms, single dads, uh, art and music, as far as I'm concerned, is essential. I don't think, I have a brilliant cousin, believe it or not, uh, that only takes two, is a senior, takes two courses, and takes the rest of them at Holyoke Community College at the high school, two courses at the high school. I think a lot of this stuff that we are providing at the high school level or in the, in the entire school may be something that could be looked at. And I'll, yeah, I know. Well, it's just, if, if you're going to propose a cut, because that's what we're, we're now voting on this item, so it's. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm I, I think that it could have been looked at, looked at differently. I, I, I've always proposed a zero base budget. When we get to a point where, where economics is what it's all about, and what we cut 0.23% of something, we, we put uh, 2.62 FTEs together and come up with one FTE. We take 0.41, I've read through the budget twice now, and it, it just seems that there's got to be a way where you can take it right back down to zero. I would propose a zero-based budget for the school and see if see what you can do with it. Well, a little too late. I, I, the way it now. Stands, I can't approve. I, I I just can't say yes until I see that all this has done, been done. Okay, Councillor Adams and then Councillor Freeman Daniels. I think there's a very sincere point there that you know that 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 we should all be looking for excess in the budget, particularly in the school department for the counselor's example, but I think that we do have a budget in front of us that I believe is relatively, in fact, very transparent, and I think that we've all spent a lot of time um, through budget hearings and maybe with our constituents and just reviewing <laughs> the budget, and um, and I I just don't see a tremendous amount of fat, so I'm not sure that it, you we would, I'm not sure if, if um, I'm not sure functionally if, if zero-based budgeting would work. Perhaps the mayor could explain um, his perspective on that. But I do think we have a budget in front of us that we have been able to look at for an extensive period of time. And frankly, I just don't see much fat that can be cut. Um, I, I think it's pretty much bare bones. In fact, the budget that we have in front of us is with substantial cuts. And only if we, the override passes next Tuesday will they be restored. So um, I... I I take seriously, and I'm not to speak for all the counselors. I, I'm sure we all do take very, very seriously budget scrutiny and safeguarding the ta taxpayers' dollar. But um, through this whole budget season, I think we've had a long opportunity to look at the budget. And if counselors are seeing anything that they view as excess, I would urge them to put a motion forward now and and propose what that is, and and we can look at that and determine if we agree that it is fat, and if so, cut it. Thank you. 
I, um, this is, this must be my ignorance because I hear you, I hear Councillor Tacey continue to say zero base budget and I don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about. I'm looking at the most transparent school department budget that we've ever gotten. We've ever gotten. And I'm looking at page 149 at printing and binding, $641. And I'm looking at conference registrations, $3,000. I mean, is there more to a zero base budget than itemizing all of the expenses that you expect to have over the coming year? And if so, what? Just exactly what I said. Take I don't it, understand. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll explain it to you. Take it right down to zero. Take what the state actually requires. I've heard so many times here that I, I asked the question of the superintendent about the higher education for the language classes. The state requires for graduation two years of a foreign language. Fine. Teach two years of a foreign language. In a, in a, they can take a third year. They can go to a community college while they're in high school. They're doing it right now. Smith offers it. Uh, Holyoke Community offers it. Uh, my cousin does it right now. Uh, so if it's available somewhere, why do you provide that and cut art and music and physical education? Cut transportation? Um. Councilor Freeman Daniels, and I'm and I'm a little wary of a back and forth debate. So it's I'm so not yeah, wary yeah. of it at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> what you what you're expressing, I do not believe, has anything to do with a zero based budget. I think what you're saying is that we need to, that you believe that the school committee should reallocate its priorities, but that does not say to me that the budget, the actual budget we have in front of us, which is very clear, there are sure there are some zeros that are probably rounded off that we end up recuperating in a, every year. That has nothing, I do not believe that what you're saying has anything to do with a zero-based budget. I think you're saying the school committee misplaces its priorities, which is why I reminded you at the last committee, at the last council meeting, that you can still take out papers to run for school committee. Absolutely. And you also <laughs> said that they provide things such as, I go back and forth with this all day, trigonometry, things such as that. You know, I understand that. These are, these are math classes. I understand all this. But the zero-based budgeting is just exactly this. Maybe it does mean priorities. Maybe it does mean provide art and music and not, not three, four, and five in language. Maybe it does mean that. Maybe it means provide busing. Maybe it doesn't mean stretch the busing out to the two-mile area and, and, bring it and provide it at, at one and a half miles. Maybe it does mean that. But whatever it means, whatever the state requires, put that together in your budget and then look at what you want to put whatever money you've got left over. if you did just what the state minimum was it would be a lot less than what the school department budget is and then take what you've got for a budget and then see what you can add to that and then fill it up with the money start at the bottom councilor schwartz then councilor carney I, i'm wondering what this discussion is at this point i mean i i i, I with all due respect councilor tacy i can't really countenance a conversation about getting rid of foreign languages in the high school. I mean, we are so far behind as a country in second languages. And, and I, I just, I have a very hard time with this as a budget conversation. So I, I would encourage us to move forward uh, based on the many hours of debate we've had and the conversation the school committee has had and the presentations the mayor has done and um, move us forward to a vote. I would like to see that happen sooner rather than later. It's, it would be my preference as well that it, we speak to the budget that we have, not the budget that we wish we had or the way, way we wish it were constructed. So as we debate this, not debate the what ifs, we are debating what we have and what is presented before us now. If there is a proposal to cut, which is what we're allowed to do, then I would like to hear a solid proposal for that cut. Councilor Carney. Not proposing a cut. Um, just clarifying again what this body's role is and that is to cut and not to necessarily second guess 
the priorities of the other elected body in the city, which is the school committee. I'll make reference to the letter by school committee member Stephanie Pick today, who did say that this city and this school committee aims not for the bare minimum, not for the bare minimum of uh, two years, but rather one that will place Northampton students um, at a level of excellence. And I do trust this uh, elected school committee and um, the chair of the school committee and Mayor Narkowitz. And um, I have no cuts to offer for the, for the school budget or for this budget in general. Any uh, to propose a cut? <laughs> I, I need to respond. Uh, well, yeah, I don't think this, I, I think uh, Councillor Carney was not talking to you directly. She was speaking to the, to the floor general, but if <laughs> I don't want to squelch your conversation or your what you're advocating, but I wanted to remind you that our principal job here now, we've gotten to this point, the arguments that you're advancing are appropriate much earlier on in the process. Um, we haven't voted yet. No, but this is a budget discussion. But you are not going to. But you cannot start the budget process over. You, have, we have the authority at this point right now, to cut or approve. And to that point, I wish the debate points would stay. We've strayed off that, and that's my bad. I just want to bring us back now to the point, our job at hand. We have a long. I budget. absolutely we agree. Have, we have zoning the level stuff. of excellence. That more that Councillor Carney is talking about, but at what cost? We're asking for an override. We're asking for two and a half million dollars, and that's part of the budget that will be voted on June 25th. Possibly, two and a half million dollar override. We are asking the taxpayers to pony up on. And have we what? At what cost? And I mean the elderly. I mean disabled. I mean single moms. I mean, Councillor, you're you're now you're now debating the override, and I'm I'm sorry. That's I think what this whole budget is about. No, well, that is not the document before us right now. We're not voting on an override budget. We're voting on a budget without an override, and that's what we're discussing now. Please uh, keep your conversation to that, uh, Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, I agree. This is our budget. We need to look at it very carefully. We need to vote on it and we need to move on. I do have to say that the mayor has spent a lengthy time with every department head on doing a level funded budget. And that's what it's all about. It's a level funded budget. So we need to move on and either do a decrease on it or approve it. Anyone else on this? Well, this is the motion is for uh, the first order here. So there will be a roll call. Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's first reading. Next reading will be. Uh, oh, we, oh, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I just. I wanted to, to move the next three financial orders. That would be the enterprise funds from DPW, the water enterprise fund, the sewer enterprise fund, and the solid waste enterprise fund as a group. Second. There's a motion to move the enterprise funds as a group. And second. Any discussion? On, on the enterprise fund? No, any discussion on, on yeah, on the on the enterprise funds, please. Yes. Not, not on the motion. Uh, to move them as a group, just on the on approval. Well, I don't know that we need to approve moving them as a group. Yeah, the motion's members. been made that they've been moved as a group. So yeah, so they're, so they're moved as those a group. have been moved as a group. If you, if, you know, if you want to parse them out or separate them, then now's the time to say so. 
Um, I'm not sure if I said this last year, but I'll say it this year. I don't have a cut to propose, but I do believe that uh, the fees for both water and sewer enterprise funds should be approved by the City Council. Thank you. Any discussion on these? Could you say that one more time? He, he had, oh, go ahead. You want to reiterate rates, that right. for Councilor Tacey? Yes, the rates. The, the rates. The fees, yeah. 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 He, he called for Utility council, fees. council to have approval over rate fees, rate amounts. And just to clarify, those are by the commissioners, the water commissioners, the right. board of public works. Right? <clears throat> no, no, I just, I think, I just wanted to make sure I understood them. I mean, it was the actual rates charged for the water right, and sewer, not the total, but the rates. Okay. Any further discussion on these three items? I, I did have a conversation today um, with two people about water and sewer enterprise funds, and I had to assure them that the water and sewer department does not hold vast sums of money and they do not. It does not take long to burn through a million dollars worth of water main or sewer main. It's, it's a, it happens all the time nationwide. There's a million dollars or two million dollars in reserve. So be it. I don't consider that hoarding payer money. Thank you. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. <coughs> yes. 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 Accept the motion. Council Murphy, you have a motion to make? Yes. I would like to move items 5 through 23, which are all of the revolving funds that basically are cash collected by the departments and turned around for for use. Second. The motions are made to put the 23 revolving counts. 19. Uh, 19, I'm sorry, 19 re revolving counts uh, on the floor. That's Those are items 5 through 23. Uh, discussion? Yeah, I'd just like to ask a, a question of um, the finance director. Sure. Uh, we recognize Susan Wright. There's been a motion uh, to recognize Susan Wright. Oh, she's recognized at all the meetings, yes. Oh, she and the mayor both, yes. Um, are, is this uh, just a question of uh, policy? Is this standard operating procedure for other municipalities to have this many revolving accounts, or is it? It just seems like a tremendous number of revolving accounts. For a community this size, it's not unusual given what the various departments are doing. And they all, they're all the 53 E and a halfs, which require you to annually reauthorize those. Yeah. We did um, eliminate one. We eliminated the fire department revolving fund, and that money's going to come into the general fund. And we added um, two in the Council on Aging because the Elder Vision publication is now coming into the operation of the department, and they'll be having two additional sources of revenue, and they'll have two additional revolving funds. So we've eliminated one, added two, but we do review them every year to make sure that they're appropriate to continue. Okay. So it's standard to have this many? Yes. Thank you. Um, to, to that point, Council Murphy, do you mind reciting some of the revolving funds? Just, yeah, so, so people know what we're talking about. Uh, one of them is a $20,000 fund for the Council on Aging gift shop for things that they sell there. One of them is the food revolving account for Council on Aging, their travel fund when they go on bus trips, the publication probably for Elder Vision, uh, the rec department for their athletic fees that they collect for the use there, the aquatic center funds that come in, uh, the vocational high school one for the farm, uh, the health one that we created not too long ago for the shots that the nurse gives out. I mean, these are the sort of things that are in these 19 funds. Uh, one for the James House. Uh, the, th those are the sort of things that we're, we're talking about. There are various amounts from 20000 to 200000 depending on if it's the gift shop or the Smith Folk Farm. But those are the sort of funds that we're talking about talking about and they've all been in place for a while have they not yeah. the law also requires us to report to you at the end of the fiscal year how much revenue came in how many ex how much was expended from each of these funds so in August when I give you kind of a wrap-up on the fiscal year I'll be giving you that report thank you sir. Okay. 
Uh, Council Freeman Day. We're not uh, shuttling. The, the amounts listed on the uh, financial orders are not amounts that we're shuttling into these funds. They're the total expenditures allowed from the funds mm -hmm. for the services and other activities that these accounts Generated by the fees right, that's from right. those, those services. Just to clarify, my question was not because I thought anything was out of line. I was just curious as to whether or not, I mean, I think the numbers are fine. Thank you. Any other discussion on the revolving funds? Roll call, please. Councilor Tyson? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Freeman Jones? Aye. Councilor Barr? Yes. 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 Okay, accept the motion for. Sure. I, I will move um, two sort of anomaly ones. Number 24, financial order, um, is the allocation of handicapped parking violation fines to the Commission on Disabilities. So they, that's something we just started doing for uh, Social Services and Veterans Affairs. So that's that fund. And um, then also uh, accept provision of Mass General Law 40, Chapter 40, Section 13D, to establish a reserve fund for future payments of accrued liabilities for compensated absences. These are two that don't really fit in a revolving fund or a capital improvements or anything. Move for approval. Uh, the That's motions have been seconded. And Susan, you want to come and speak to these? We established a revolving fund for the parking handicap fines last year, but um, our procurement officer, Joe Cook, found that we actually should be doing this particular program under a different statute, which now, once you vote this, we'll take the balance that's in that revolving fund on June 30th, move it to this new fund, and then the new fund does not need to be annually reauthorized. So it's just being more consistent with what is in the law. The establishment of this fund was through Councilor Tacey's pursuit of uh, trying to secure money from handicap violations to be right. appropriated for. Right. Thanks. So as a 50, since, since it won't be a 53 E and a half, it won't have to be annually, re, annually renewed, and it won't have a cap on how much money it can have in that fund. Right. And we did both work on that. Mm -hmm. Councilor Tacey? Did, um, does this allow a little more flexibility in them to utilize these funds also it's not so restrictive no. there it, it was some restrict it was pretty restrictive the way it was initially set up and it had to, it had to do with mailings and some publications or printings and things such as that and it actually didn't have to do anything with like a construction project or so I'm kind of curious as to <coughs> flexibility that we would allow them to utilize this I mean because I think they probably need a little more flexibility Council LaBarge was involved in that discussion. Council, you want to speak to that? Yeah, we both yeah. were. Okay. Um, the mayor, because of what had occurred when we went after to do the mass general laws on the changing, what had happened was all of us not realizing it because we were so pleased about getting the money allocated from the parking fines that we actually, you and I, had changed the whole procedure, not realizing it. And I, even with the financial director before he left, not realizing it, that it had changed that law. So we went into that Chapter 40, Section 8J, which made a big difference. So the whole procedure was changed on that. Um, I don't have the paper in front of you and you don't either, but it actually says what we use it for, which is for the library, the use of the library for like Braille and so forth like that. Um, advertising, printing, there's quite a bit that's involved in that. There Training. There seems to be a lot of strings attached to it, but um, it all came from the elimination of the $400 line item from the mayor's budget. Exactly. A few they years ago. Nothing, um, so anyway, uh, I, I, I'll stop. But thank you very much. And the, and the funds are, have to be used upon recommendation of the Commission on Disability, and then approval of the mayor. So exactly. it, it, it does not come to the council. 
It says as authorized by a vote of city council and approval of the mayor. So I yes. believe the expenditures are going to have to come through city okay. council. Okay. So it's actually a little more restrictive than the 53E and a half because the 53E and a half allowed the department head to make those expenditures. So now expenditures from this fund are going to have to have approval of the council on disability, approval of the mayor, and then city council approval. So, and so you are saying that whatever they would like to spend it on, mm -hmm. they can as long as the city council approves it. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and as an example, which we are looking, we have ordered already with approval from the mayor at $250 starting off, is new audiovisual um, techniques that we need for people who are hard of hearing. So, and I think that was up to, do you remember how much that was, Susan? About 5,000, I think. We're pretty close to that. So that will have to come to city council. This is huge for, dis for the dis disabled. This is perfect. Yes. Thank you. The other um, order that is in this motion is a, is a new fund that we'd, we'd be establishing. This was a new fund that the Department of Revenue just recently authorized communities to have. It allows us to take what is going to be left over. We have an account um, basically for the sick leave buyback. So when employees terminate, if they have a certain number of years with the city, they're eligible for a small portion of a buyback of their sick leave. And we budget for that every year. What this account will allow us to do to, is to take any balance in that account and move it into this account at the end of the fiscal year. That way we can start to build up a fund because some years there's a small amount of retirees and some years, like this year, there could be, there is over almost 30 retirees at the end of the fiscal year, mm -hmm. particularly in the schools. So this will allow us to build up a small fund to deal with these sick leave buybacks. So this is a new, um, new fund that was recently authorized by the Department of Revenue. And our, uh, our auditor, Tom Scanlon, recommended that we pursue this. Any other discussion or questions? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 <coughs> yes. Okay. And Councilor Murphy, uh, by the way, um, now the heat are up by a couple points. Um, I'd like to move the last eight financial orders, which all are capital plan things. Yep. And we discussed them. Seconded. Capital plan. That's been moved and seconded, the capital plan. Uh, any discussion on these items? Murphy, you want to talk about them a little bit, or um, sure? These and, and we spoke about these. These are these are things that were outside the uh, the, the general fund budget. Uh, we're buying things like power lift stretchers for the ambulances so they don't injure themselves lifting people into the ambulances. Uh, one of the largest items is uh, stabilization of the river road retaining wall so we don't lose that sewer line coming down from Williamsburg. Um, buying various vehicles, buying a truck for the parking maintenance division. These are all things we discussed in the, specifically in the capital plan. And these are, when we had our budget meetings, we talked about th funds outside. For instance, the school department has a, a multi-year technology plan that's in this money. Um, and the, the retaining wall, Riverbank Road. Yeah. And hope for other monies to help with that somewhere <laughs> that 400,000 is actually a match that we're required to put up for the FEMA grant that we're going to receive so just that's that's a portion of that okay. thank you and that's the stabilization of river road which is compromised by a washout what is that is that forthcoming it is yes it is we're st we're working on the details now yeah, and having some conversations with Williamsburg about it as well. Okay. So, I, think I haven't heard anything about it in the last few months, so I was kind of curious as to where it's yeah. going. Yeah, we have uh, we have to get some uh, documents now completed for uh, the state and and FEMA um, and uh, be prepared for that. And part of that, one of the big steps is having the 25% match, which is why we 
it wasn't part of the capital improvement process, but then we got the approval for the grant after waiting for two years. So that's why we put it in this so that we could get the 25% match to be eligible for the uh, for the grant. And this is right out of our capital program. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Lee. It's a question for the mayor, actually. Uh, yeah, it's for you. We, uh, we have <coughs> now a number of SUV vehicles in uh, public safety and uh, I think maybe one for parking enforcement. Is that right? Um, could you, there's been a lot of chatter about whether they're necessary. Um, could you talk about that briefly? Uh, sure, so um, the police department uh, um, has a, a, a very detailed uh, vehicle replacement uh, program um, where they you know, try to um, uh, replace uh, uh, I think about three of their vehicles a year uh, so that over a rotating basis their entire fleet gets you know rotated out um, again these are 24 7 vehicles uh, and you know that are being used three shifts a day around the clock um, and so um, one of the other things that happened is um, some people may have followed in the news and I'm sure Councillor uh, Carney was particularly saddened, but the beloved Crown Vic uh, went out of uh, production uh, board. And so um, we had to go out and look. F f lots of departments now are looking for new, uh, the new whatever platform for the police vehicle. So um, after doing a search, this new Ford Explorer slash Interceptor platform was selected. Um, Interestingly, though it's an SUV, it actually gets better gas mileage than the Crown Vix. Um, obviously, it's better in the snow, has uh, you know better capacity for equipment, better visibility, and that's the one that they've chosen. So, um, and interestingly, as part of the, um, the city staff program that I talked to you about, you know, we went to a uh, we we participated in a statewide StatNet. Uh, where they looked at data from all the participating communities. And actually, Northampton's was held up. This was one aspect that was held up as a model for the state that, that they have had the foresight to actually build in this vehicle replacement program. Many departments don't, and then reach a point where they are facing having to replace their entire fleet. Um, so we feel pretty confident that this is you know I will say that in the capital improvement program there were requests for some additional vehicles that we didn't make we didn't uh, bring forward um, uh, there was an additional three vehicles but we only selected uh, one of them uh, to be part of this particular capital plan um, uh, SUVs in the um, I'm trying to think there's a there's a Subaru that we purchased in the last capital plan uh, for the um, building commissioner uh, and we've got a couple of vehicles, uh, used vehicles that we're going to purchase for the health department. They have um, one of the Crown Vicks, which is dead, and uh, and they have another one that's about to die. And so they're going to. So again, you know, these part of the calculus is these are people that are required these inspectors to go all around the city all day um, to inspections, and so we want them to have a reliable vehicle in the case of the building department they're actually performing a public safety uh, function as well and uh, and the alternative is to have people submit mileage and and get reimbursed for mileage in their personal vehicles and there's liability issues so we believe that having a sensible vehicle replacement policy is is sound practice uh, so that's what that uh, that's why you see some of those in there uh, to follow up and then so okay. gets better gas mileage better on emissions definitely but it's got the downside is that everyone's a little higher up They're downside yeah. well I don't know, for them it's probably not a downside they have better visibility but yeah it's got the flex the Ford you know flex engine and uh, definitely better gas mileage than the than the crown Vix. thank you Council Murphy you want to and, follow yeah and we buy these off the state bid we so do. we're not paying dealer price for yes. these things we buy them in a group with other communities yes. and the state police and everybody else. So we get a pretty good price on these vehicles with this bulk purchase. So it's not like we're Definitely. going in and paying $40,000 a car at a Ford dealer. 
And you're now starting to see other communities, the state police, this is going to become a much more common. This is the new vehicle. Crown Vic, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I think the VA hospital has them now. Um, and so this is what you're going to see. So, uh, uh, so again, it's part of a longstanding replacement program. And, um, and again, it's, in, the, in the long run, it's going to save us money on increased maintenance costs and gas mileage, all those things. So, and, and again, when you dial 911, you want a police vehicle that can get there uh, uh, and not having to worry about maintenance issues or those kinds of things. So, um, Councillor Tacey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a mountain of cruising. Most of my, not most, a few of my constituents say, well, what about the 50 cars they've got in the James lot and the 50 cruisers? Well, there's not 50. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere near it. Mm -hmm. And over a third of them aren't worth the scrap. Um, they don't run. Um, so if I do call 911, I don't want them to go out there and try and start the wrong cruiser. And we are I mean, in, in line with the city's uh, adoption of the green communities uh, standards. We are beginning to now we're going to look at surplusing those um, because we don't we're now no longer going to be recycling these old vehicles around because of the gas mileage issue and frankly the maintenance issue so that's one of the other reasons why for the once the old crown vix died for the health department we're now going to go out and get them a used uh, vehicle um, yeah. okay. we did we did actually in capital improvements talk about this and they do they do want to keep enough of them around so like a detail these cars are, don't have the computers that the line vehicles have and everything but they want to keep a couple around so if a guy's doing a road job and needs a car he can take one of the old cars it isn't set up like a line car but it's got lights and they can have it there or if <clears throat> they called a couple guys over on shift uh, because of an event they'll have a couple extra cars for them to drive so they'll still keep some of them around they said but they're not they don't have the computers they're not set up the way the line vehicles are but it does offer them flexibility for road jobs and flexibility for holdover guys on shifts if they want a couple extra bodies that they can still get around i wish you luck on finding buyers when you surplus those okay um uh the only other thing i wanted to add <clears throat> in, in sort of in response to what Councillor freeman daniels asked was that uh, the other thing I, I try to point out to people about the capital plan is the funding sources. This is either bonded money or it's one-time uh, types of money, uh, reprogrammed capital projects. Uh, we're not using sort of general fund revenue, if you will. Um, and so that's what, we're, that's what we're dedicating for the capital plan. We've made the decision to fund a capital, uh, cash capital account, and that's what we're using the money for. Um, uh, <clears throat> we're trying to move away from using one-time monies to fund general operating revenues. So, thank you. One last question for the mayor. The <clears throat> financial order appropriation, $90,000 for the fire department revolving fund, that is, is that all of the money when you close that? Uh, there actually, there is some additional uh, money left in that account, but it will close out at the end of the year. We're actually... Uh, those four um, uh, safer grant funded positions are funded out of that account, right? Uh, and when and those when that's completed, those will be uh, that account will be closed out. I think I'm representing that correctly. Um, actually, the safer grant people are funded out of the safer grant. Okay. We'll continue with this with the surplus. Yeah. But it, this will close to general fund. There'll be probably about forty thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's July 1st, that will be transferred to the general fund. Be That's correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Um, another one, the 49000 um, for the one-ton pickup truck mm -hmm. for parking maintenance department. I was asked before our meeting in regards about that $49,000. Could you explain the truck? What is the age of the other one? Yeah. Um, let me just get to that one here. Um, yeah, this is a, uh, the current vehicle, as it says in the description, is a 2003 uh, GMC. Um, and uh, we've spent in, in a couple of prior fiscal years alone $8,000 to try to keep that thing running. Um, 
and it's a pretty important truck. It's what they use if you see them going around with the, well, they do snow removal, they do trash pickup, uh, they collect meter revenues in it. <clears throat> and so uh, we've just made the decision that it's, we're, it's, it's, uh, we're putting, throwing good money after bad by continuing to put money into this uh, vehicle. So that's why we're using parking uh, meter reserve fund or receipts reserved for appropriation from parking to fund this new vehicle. Thank you. Yeah. Any other discussion on these items from the revolving fund? That was just, we are going to trade in the old vehicle toward the purchase of the new one, too, just FYI. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? Councilor Freeman Daniels? This will be our last comments on the budget for this year. That is, well, until we vote next week as well. No. So we, I mean, and at this point, it's a matter of hours. <laughs> it's just, we, have, we have to hurry up so Mary can actually post it legally. So <laughs> it's, um, but this is the last budget item on our agenda. So uh, I'll ask Mary to call the roll. Yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Okay. And you thought you were done? Well, um, we, <laughs> Carolyn Mish has been waiting patiently. We are now up to, uh, what's, oh, what do we have first? Oh, this is the second reading. I'm sorry. This is the um, the Bridge Street School drainage uh, easement. Ooh, second reading. Second. Uh, I mean the historic uh, the, the gift the easement of the gift by uh, historic Northampton. There was moved and seconded. Council Freeman Daniels. Uh, thank you. I'm going to offer an amendment here. Um, uh, please let me offer the amendment and then give the give the background if you don't mind. Um, under the third whereas. The third whereas it says said easement said does easement. not provide the public with any rights of access. Yeah, so said easement executed on June 19th, 2013. So the amendment is to add to the language said easement enacted. Executed. Executed. On June 19th, 2013. 2013. And then a second. Today? No, today's the 20th. And then a second amendment under the uh, order? Uh, well, can you give the Secretary the language of your first amendment? Said easement under the third whereas. Said easement executed on June 19th, 2013. Does not provide the public. Okay. public. June 19th. You talk about yesterday? You it's, that it's yesterday on purpose, yes. Okay. And that uh, under the order itself, mm -hmm. um, that the easement, um, that the city of Northampton strike acting through its mayor. Okay. So just strike the language between the two commas. Is authorized to acquire the ease, the, instead of such, the easement signed June 19th, 2013. <laughs> By gift. Why are the such? Oh, okay. Stri Change. Strike the such, put the. Okay. Signed June 19th, 2013. Right after easement. The easement signed June 19th, 2013. By gift of historic Northampton. And you want to expand on your. I need a second. Oh, waiting for a second? For second. The, okay. Thank you. Second. Uh, <laughs> This was um, this was the this was the easement that uh, the Graves Avenue residents were concerned about, as um, were, as being uh, the a, a possibility the possibility of basically allowing under the guise of adding a storm drain allowing a public access. It was basically it's basically the same piece of property that the, the council tabled um, earlier in this session. Um, so. Uh, I consulted with, uh, after getting permission from uh, the mayor and uh, the council president, I consulted with the city solicitor, who added language to the uh, to the to the easement. Um, I then uh, relayed it to the Graves Avenue residents, who um, 
added some additional language. I then uh, ran that by the city solicitor who, um, after a brief negotiation, uh, finally ended with an easement that um, I executed yesterday it, um, with uh, Historic Northampton. Uh, and um, I'd like, this is a different easement from the one that was executed in April. Uh, so it's important, I believe, that uh, this is the easement that uh, is, is uh, accepted by the city. So the purpose of inserting the date is to reflect it, to distinguish this easement from the previous? Yes. And um, it, it just, I'm striking acting through its mayor just because it, um, the DPW told me that I should do it, so I went and did it. <laughs> All right. So, so you'll draw the bead then. <laughs> do, do you have a memo from the uh, city solicitor to this effect? I mean, I can give you our correspondence, but uh, the solicitor okayed this uh, easement, which is now uh, signed and uh, notarized. Signed and notarized as of yesterday? Yes, signed and notarized yesterday. Okay. Well, if you could make sure that that gets to the secretary. I, I brought it here with the express purpose of doing so. Uh, the amendment's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the amendment, on the amended language? Uh, right. All those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 <coughs> Any further discussion on the on the article? Roll, uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. No. Okay. Roll call on this, please. As amended. Yes. 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 Okay. We have half an hour. Uh, we are now up to the um, items 13 through 16. Two. But, excuse me? Two and three. Two and three? Yes. Yeah, two and You're right. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, okay. This is <clears throat> this is the uh, this is relevant to the same issue, of course, as the water line running from the property on which Bridge Street School is located crosses the land of Peter Jeswald and Phyllis K. Jeswald and Bob Abrams, located 4450 Graves Avenue without the benefit express easement, therefore, and the, actually, essentially, this is the granting of an easement that we heard talked about. I'd accept the motion to put on the floor. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. You want to speak to this, Council Chairman Daniels? Yeah, this is, um, this is just a complex system of, uh, of easements. This, this is actually, if you, if you look at it, it's a little box. Um, of land that ends at the that ends with the new public way that we just uh, created, uh, but before the um, but is necessary to uh, um, to uh, complete the drainage. The That's basically right. So the the one thing I do I want to say I want to um, I, I want to really thank uh, the Department of Public Works, Dave Valletta and um, Central Services, um, David Pomeranz for. Uh, for coming out and working with the Graves Avenue residents. Um, but uh, we do wish that this had happened uh, in, a, in a way where the residents were more, were, were better informed um, ahead of time. And it's not just, it's not just about information. Um, the Graves Avenue residents took it upon themselves to, um, to fund the planting of uh, some beautiful ornamental trees that, uh, that were actually, they, unbeknownst to them actually on private property now we we just took them um and uh you know the, a couple of them are being destroyed by this uh by this um drainage line um they're beautiful they're some beautiful 20 foot uh exotic trees and uh they they won't be they're they can't be replaced with a similar sized tree and if the uh dpw had uh come to the Graves Avenue Association, which is an active and, and uh, willing association, just a little bit ahead of time, 
um, that might this might have been avoided. Uh, so um, I, uh, I, 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 we we need to deal with the water, which right now runs into Bridge Street School when it rains into the basement. We need to deal with that, but uh, I do wish that um, in the future that the city uh, be more um, open and uh, and get involved earlier when, when it comes to these sorts of things. Thank you. Councilor Tacey. Is that piece on here? Yeah, I think it's where your, um, your middle finger is. The very end here? It looks like a little box. See it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? Uh, roll call, please. <coughs> this is first reading. Yes. 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 Next up is the expansion of the historic district to include much of Round Hill. This is the first reading. Is there a reason why we have to do a second meeting on this? I know. Councilor. Public it's, uh, uh, com it's, it's coming back in a week. Oh. We can do it next week. We can do it next week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Starting in five days or something. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, we're, I think we're good. Call from the other side. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, as I said, this is to expand the historic district to include much around illness of the first reading. Accept a motion, put it on the floor. So moved. Discussion? Council, <laughs> Council Specter. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, this was, um, this went before the Elm Street Historic Commission. There, this was in process with uh, a number of meetings. It was, again, something that had, I, I always hate to use the word consensus uh, on it because then someone's going to say, well, I didn't agree. Um, but consensus actually means that it moves forward despite disagreements. And, uh, I didn't actually hear, I was, I actually, this was almost unanimous by the, the residents. Even the objection, the only objection was from the developer of the Clark School, which was Opal, and even their objection said, this has a 99.99% .99 chance that it will not affect them at all. And um, everybody else, so the Historic Commission voted unanimously to approve this. I know that there are some counselors who object in general to, um, making these historic districts or expanding them, but I would encourage the council to approve this. Since, and, and these meetings, by the way, in, included also uh, abutters on streets that were nearby. We tried to be very inclusive, include a lot of people in this, not just to make it just the areas right around Round Hill Road area, but we actually invited people from the neighborhood as well. And, uh, and I think the, the Elm Street Historic District did a great job in trying to include as many people as possible in this discussion. <coughs> Questions? Comments? Carolyn's yeah. queued up to speak anyway. Councilor Murphy? So it's like 18 <coughs> properties and open, right? Yes. It's like 18 privately held properties. Well, one of them, Smith, Opal, and then 18 private properties. And those 18 all, if they all acquiesce to it, God bless them. You know, it's having served on that, it's neighbors regulating neighbors, and if they want to do that, God bless them. <laughs> so they have your, kind of your blessing. Kind of my blessing. <laughs> God forgive them, they know not what they do, but if they want to do it, I won't stand in their way. Is it going to be like your yes, no vote? I don't know what, um, not, that okay, all right. not that confusing. In the resolution. Um, any other discussion? <coughs> Roll call, please. Yes. Yes. No, nay. This is emphatic no. Yes. Sure, yes. 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 Okay, that's the first, that, that is the first reading everyone punchy yet yeah you ready to talk about <laughs> major zoning changes Ooh. it's too late 
This now we're up to items 13, 14, 15, and 16 in the ordinance. Uh, Carolyn Mish has been waiting very patiently for some time. Uh, I would accept the motion to put, do you want to put them all on the floor? Yes, yes. Or I want the second yeah. the motion to be seconded. Uh, I'd accept a recognition request for Carolyn Mish. Move to recognize Senior Planner Mish. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Hello, Carolyn. <coughs> what you doing here? <laughs> Pack a lunch. <laughs> Pack a lunch. <laughs> Pack a flask. <laughs> 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 Um, so, um, I, I guess to um, start the conversation, I think I'll go over generally the overview of the whole package and then I can go into details of the ordinances. Most of you all have participated in one or various of the hearings throughout the process, throughout the long um, process. And, but I want to go over the overview of the um, ordinances, quick history of that process some goals and um, key components of the ordinance. And then certainly we can go into the details of each district if you would like. Um, as you may recall, as part of the um, implementation of Sustainable Northampton, we started by doing sort of a piecemeal implementation of the zoning ordinances with, started with commercial districts. And then we did a water supply protection district change and some other things. The, the package in front of you consists of residential um, zoning, proposed zoning changes to sort of the core neighborhood. So it's sort of the biggest residential component of the implementation of the plan that we've undertaken. Um, and there are four ordinances in the package that deal with urban residential A, B, and C district, and then a separate ordinance that is elsewhere in the, in the um, that deals with the layout and orientation of buildings on lots. Urban residential A, B, and C are about, comprise about 60% of the neighborhoods in Northampton, so they really are, um, 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 consist of, of a large swath of the city. The idea is to merge uh, the tables of use and the tables of dimensions that are currently in the zoning into one table for each district so that you can go to one location um, in your neighborhood or if you want or looking for another um, district and find out most of what you need to know about what's allowed and how you build it in that district. And so we feel like that's a um, simplification of the ordinance and we've been doing that all along with the commercial districts and now the residential districts. Um, and we've also identified a, sort of a list of uses that are categorized by, um, by right uses, site plan and special permit in a way that we hope is more user friendly. Going back over the history just a little bit, going back to actually 2005, we had an initial kickoff to the Sustainable Northampton process in which we had lots of public uh, meetings. We had a charrette, and at, during that time, um, it was really revealed um, that the consultants that came in and the discussions that were held really highlighted the disconnect between the zoning and um, what's, um, what's allowed in the neighborhoods and how the neighbors had neighborhoods have been built out and the demands for housing were also um, highlighted there sort of from the range of uh, modest cost housing all the way up to um, um, sort of the, the upper end of, of that. Um, we know at that time it was highlighted that we had, we were pretty good at subsidize, providing subsidized housing for affordable units and really good at um, providing opportunities for very high-end housing. But basically everything in between was where we had a big gap. So that's going back to 2005 with lots of public comments. That was a kickoff to our Sustainable Northampton plan process. This is about two years, lots of public meetings and discussions, not just about residential zoning um, issues or housing issues, but um, issues of energy and sustainability and transportation and things like that. Um, after the plan was adopted, we spent about two years um, through with a subcommittee um, called the Zoning Revisions Committee that looked at implementing the plan, 
they looked at residential zoning changes, had public meetings about that and input in that process. They also looked at other range of um, zoning implementation that didn't deal with housing, like King Street and um, home businesses, chickens, um, goats, and things like that. Um, on a parallel track, we had more public input through a housing, the housing partnership did um, a housing um, needs assessment that's fed into the process as well. <laughs> then the planning board sort of took all of those pieces, the recommendations coming out of all these different um, public uh, processes, and really started to hone in on how we could address the zoning changes um, for uh, starting with just these core neighborhoods. And so in 2012, uh, the planning board came out and did some public forums actually last fall to gather more input on sort of draft changes. That led to further discussions and more public meetings and through this spring of 2013 where um, modifications were made to address those um, very specific concerns that were identified after um, the draft regulations were um, put out for public forum, put out for public comment. And then modifications have happened since then, so since the introduction to you all um, at, at this city council level. Um, all along, the goals have always been to bring the zoning into parity with how the neighborhoods have been built, to eliminate substantial amounts of non-conforming aspects of the zoning. So many of the single, two, and three family homes and even um, larger multifamily structures don't comply with the current zoning standards. The idea was also to create flexibility in within the neighborhoods and for family changes if people needed to expand units or contract based on their income. It would allow new options for new housing. Um, also to encourage preservation of um, those older homes and those neighborhoods that um, are near and dear to folks in the city. Um, and allow that reinvestment um, of those um, older homes and utilize those funds to um, potentially build more units that could provide housing for folks, but also offset the cost of that, um, those renovations. And of course, to simplify the ordinance. Um, one of the key components is an introduction of design criteria that we haven't had in residential districts. And it's really more based on form as opposed to architectural standards. The idea was to try to address uh, concerns of incompatibility of new development in neighborhoods and we probably can all point to examples of, of uh, projects that might not quite fit within the existing context of the neighborhood not necessarily by architectural style because everyone has different opinions about what types of um, um, house designs they like um, but it's really more about massing and scale and where parking is located and buffers for those things that are ancillary to residential units, um, but that are, are necessary, like um, parked cars and things of that sort. Um, we've adjusted some parking calculations to make it simpler to determine um, how many parking spaces are required um, per unit. And um, uh, we've eliminated some uses that really were not appropriate in residential districts. Some of the modifications that um, have, I, I think maybe we can go through the details of each district if you would like, and then we could talk about some modifications that have happened since introduction. And those have all been redlined for you in your packet so that they should be um, pretty clear. So. Um, questions, comments? <coughs> Did, have we reduced the open space requirement in any of these places? There have been, um, in urban residential A, the proposal is to reduce um, open space from 60% per lot to, um, uh, I believe it's 40%. I'm sorry, let me just look at that number. Um, to 40% minimum open space in urban residential A. In urban residential B, the current open space requirement is 50% on a parcel, and, the re and so the proposal on the table is 40% of the lot, which means, and, and when, I, when we talk about open space, it means um, 
basically anything that's open to the air. So it doesn't include driveways and it doesn't include sheds or any kind of structure that's on a parcel. Um, so any of those would be considered lot coverage and um, be counted towards, towards that. What was the public's reaction to it? Um, um, I'm curious. <coughs> I didn't there hasn't been, those. yeah, yeah, I, I don't know that we heard a lot about that. There was a concern about maintaining open space, which is why we didn't really want to address, bump the numbers down. And in fact, the third district, urban residential C, the current requirement is 30%, and we've left it at 30% because we did hear concerns, particularly in the um, neighborhoods um, in the urban residential C district, which are the neighborhoods that surround just downtown Northampton. Um, so that's staying the same. And, and what was the impetus behind the garage or parking structure attached must be set back 20 feet and the garage structure shall comprise of no more than 30% of the front facade? So these um, layouts and orientation and design were based on, um, again, sort of looking at the neighborhoods that were built. These are neighborhoods that are, you know, built from the beginning of the time of the city up to, you know, 19, probably the latest 1950s. In some cases, you have some older or um, more recent construction. But for the most part, at that time, garages or storage units were behind and, and really accessory to principal structures in the neighborhoods. They might be set way back in the rear as carriage houses. Um, and the um, current trend is to have more attached garages, and many times people attach those garages uh, more front and center to the lot. So the idea is to, in order to keep sort of consistency of the character of a neighborhood, garages are always sort of ancillary and, and accessory to a principal structure. So by making, ensuring that that facade is, um, doesn't comprise more than an accessory function, um, these um, um, uh, design criteria were established. So you could no longer build a, a house on top of a two on top of a two bay, two car garage. Well, and have your second floor be living space. You could still do that. <coughs> the the um, provision for these standards. Um, mm -hmm. um, the idea is that. If you, um, the idea is to not, to make sure that it, it's not more than 30%. So it potentially you still could do that. But it would probably be 50%. I mean, if you had a uh, could be. dwelling unit above. Well, I mean, it's the way you design it. Yeah. The idea is, th is to design it in a way that you meet this because traditionally the neighborhoods have been <coughs> built in a way that do don't have garages sort of as your front face um, to the street. I know there's one on Mary Ann's uh, ward right on Ryan Road on the left. There's a gray one. It's a two car garage with a house on the top, living unit on the top, right at, before you get to the school on the left. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Murphy. Just, just some observations because this is um, Councillor Bardsley and I were on the committee that suggested the zoning revisions committee way back when so I've been kind of dealing with this for a long time and just some general observations about this whole process the current zoning ordinance most of it dates from like the mid 70s so it's been around for 30 years and as a result most residents of Northampton have sort of a second nature approach to it they get the feel for what you can do and what you can't do and that's going to change in a pretty major way. I mean, these are substantial changes to our residential zoning districts. And sometimes sustainability <coughs> sounds good as an abstract concept on paper, but it, when it lands next to you, you have a different feeling about it. And I noticed most of the proponents who spoke here tonight we've seen before, and it's on their radar because these changes affect them and their properties and perhaps they've been trying to do things that they can't do now but why they're paying attention is this is going to facilitate some of the things that they wanted to, to do and we should not underestimate that these changes in these three zones are going to make a difference in all of our neighborhoods and all the wards of the city so it's it's not going to um, go unnoticed and 
I think if we do enact them, we're going to have to monitor and we're going to hear about it from our residents as to how this actually goes and how they react to it. So if we approve it, we have to sort of keep an open mind and listen to what they say and what they think about it. Um, because I think the general public as a whole does not have this on their radar yet. The, the people who were here did because they've dealt with it, but I don't think the general public does. I do want to thank the Zoning Revisions Committee folks and the Planning Board folks and the planning staff for all the work that they they put into it. If you've been involved with it, you know how much work it was, but as I said, the general public, I don't think has this even on their radar yet. Um, I did talk to Carolyn about this a couple months ago when the timetable was starting for this. Um, it's something that I think we should take our time with because I certainly, this is substantial enough, I would not want our constituents to think that we snuck this by them over the summer when they weren't paying attention because I don't think this is on their radar, but it will be at some point when it affects their neighborhoods. And I do want to acknowledge what Carolyn said earlier. This is new ground. This is the first time the planning board has done design, any sort of design guideline, and even though this is a very minor step in that direction and I think they respect the fact that this is new ground for them having done that before people often don't see that coming so that that will be new ground for them and and also just an observation and not in a negative way but as Councillor Freeman Daniels noted tonight the planning board sort of exists in its own world it does its own special little thing and I think that's kind of why they propose but they propose and we dispose because we do live in the political world where all these great ideas have to get passed by our constituents and we're responsible to them. So please, my recommendation would be let's understand what we're doing because I don't think the general public as a whole realizes the difference this will make. And that difference is going to manifest itself over time because it's going to take you know, the family of a deceased person disposing of the property and realizing that it's not only a house but two building lots under the new zoning ordinances. Uh, so it might not change things tomorrow, but 10 years from now, it's going to still be making changes in neighborhoods. So I think we should think long and hard about this because we're the last stop. Once, once we deal with this, this is the way it's going to be. Councilor Carney, then Councilor Wolf. <coughs> okay. uh, generally, um, Carolyn, this zoning change liberalizes uh, develop gives more flexibility to homeowners in terms of their property and what they might do with it and so I would venture to say in terms of uh, what folks might discover that they don't know right now is in fact that they have more options for what they might do with their property and may in that respect uh, be pleasantly surprised with the, uh, with the opportunities that they would have. So my, it, it's, it's my suspicion that those who haven't been paying close attention, um, rather than being dismayed, might actually uh, be, um, find out that they have opportunities now that they didn't have under previous zoning. Uh, that's just my thought in response to Councilor Murphy's suggestion about- Councilor Lepard, then Councilor Adams. Concerned of what I'm hearing from Councillor Murphy about what could happen down the line, and can you explain that again? Where you're saying, say, if a family or a member of a family deceased or something, and explain this. Well, oh, just you know, the change won't happen tomorrow, but <coughs> what this is going to make possible is more infill. So you might have a retired couple living in a house now that will all of a sudden have a building lot next to their property because of the new dimensional guidelines for building lots. Now they might not go out tomorrow and develop that lot, but when they pass away and their kids inherited it, their kids may be told, hey, you've got a house and a building lot. And so 10 years from now, when their estate settles, that may become a building lot because of what we say today. So the, while a property owner might be delighted with the additional potential for their property, the neighbors might not be. So it, it's a, a multifaceted thing that doesn't develop itself immediately, but will over, over time. And I'm, I mean, I w I'm actually in favor of it. I just want us to understand the impacts of what we're voting for. 
Councilor Adams, Councilor Specter, Councilor Freeman Daniels. I agree with some of what Councilor Murphy said. Um, with respect to the pace, I understand that this has not been a quick paced process. And I also understand, um, Mr. Gilson said earlier, it's been in the works a very long time. But I also believe that um, given the magnitude of the proposal, that even though the pace has been slow, I believe it, c it can be even somewhat slower. And, 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 I, and I do think that it, it is, despite all the efforts to, to get the word out, I think it still could take a lot of people by surprise. And I, I really like a lot of, a lot of these proposals. I, I, I particularly appreciate that well, there are more options for properties and there are, more, there, there, there are more options for possible affordable units in the city. I really appreciate those um, parts of it. I, do, I am a little bit concerned about some of the large developments and where they could fit in certain parts of the city, which could potentially be problematic. But I would be happy to see this process slowed even more so for more opportunity for the public to see what it is for those who aren't tuned in as, as, as much as some of the people have shown up tonight and so that they can um, weigh in to us as well. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not opposed to slowing it down. I'm not sure it's going to have much of a result because oftentimes things don't happen until they see, right. we see what's happening. I mean, we've, in Ed Lou yeah. saw the presentation. This has been going on for a long, a long, long time. And one of the questions I had was, could you explain the interface between the zoning changes and the whole visioning process we did? How long ago was that? Um, because so six, if you could explain years. that, because some of this we did do extensive outreach <laughs> and surveying. And oftentimes, I think what's happening here is the public says one thing, and then when you get down to the details of what they say, that it affects me and, as you're saying, somebody next door exactly. to me or my property. So you say, well, wow, that's, I wanted this to happen. That's the vision. Right. But now we're in, in the details of it. And right. so could you explain where, where this came from in terms of that whole, the sure. whole visioning process? And Sure, and you're right, time has, um, passed since 2006-2007 um, because implementation takes a long time. The way that the city has decided to do it is, you know, um, on a, on a um, budget <laughs> that we can, you know, do it in-house. So during that process, there was a lot of discussion about, um, about our, our needs and our, and our housing needs and how we weren't meeting the housing needs and, and sustainability and how where we want to be building new homes and new um, um, places for uh, um, for commercial development is on existing infrastructure, is walkable and bikeable. And so all of those things were very um, strongly supported through the plan process and they're all, they all show up in, in policies through, that are sprinkled throughout the entire Sustainable Northampton plan. So lots of discussion at that point, and you're right, the details really, really matter. And so since for the last six, seven years, that's where we've been honing in on the details. And, you know, in many forums, we had um, certainly the usual suspects show up, but we had um, dozens of people come to these. And, and we did quite a bit of outreach for last fall, sort of um, breakout of the, the, the proposed draft. So in September, we sent out to all of you to, to ask that you then send to your constituents notice of the public forums. And we did get um, fairly good turnout, but we, we did a lot of outreach for those public forums in September because we knew that, you know, it had to be specific for people to react to um, because at some level when you're talking about policy, every, everyone's on board and then, then they probably start paying more attention when it gets very specific. So we wanted to make sure we got to um, a lot of people in September. And that led to even further sort of more, um, we had a couple of ward meetings actually. Um, ward 3 had a spe specific meeting after those September forums in order to get, you know, really into the weeds of the details of this. So um, I um, think that it, it is, it's hard to know sort of, how much more time would then allow more input? And we certainly have, over those years, had people come in, and, and some of them were probably here tonight, um, wanting to know how they might be able to use uh, or what they can do with their 
a state lot that they inherited from their parents and it has this big open gap on the street and and it doesn't make sense that they can't put a house on it and and that kind of thing so those we have heard from those folks for the last 10 even beyond before sustainable north Mountain. Excuse me, carolyn uh we are now in violation of rules okay uh move so to, uh, move to extend past the 11 o'clock hour there's been a motion to suspend rule 27 is there a second is anyone seconded? Second it. Oh, okay, and it's been seconded. All those in favor of suspending rules to continue the meeting, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Hey. Any abstentions or sort of votes? I'm abstaining. I'm abstaining. And an abstention. I'll abstain too. Oh. Okay. Then I presume you will not be talking at the, beyond this oh. point. No. <laughs> That's not part of it. It's so the grown ups voted yes. <laughs> not necessarily. That <laughs> might be the children who like to talk. Who voted, who, how many yes votes? So that's my, my concern. There were five I voted yes, yes, and there were two no and two abstentions. Thank you. I voted no. You voted oh, no. there were three no. Oh, so uh, actually, there were three no and two abstentions. So I think we're done. Can we, can we take a roll call? Roll call vote, please, for the, uh, yes. extending the meeting. Okay. I, am I allowed to ask a question? It's a roll call vote. We're it's both. a roll call vote. No, but I, can I ask a question about Sure, it's a point of order. The, yeah. The, yeah point. I just want to know the consequence of not extending. Then we're we done. Could, I understand we're, we're done, yeah. but what's yeah. the consequence of this? We do not complete this? the agenda that's laid out before us of these, these last three items. And it just gets pushed to the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Next meeting next week. That's not I, fair. I, 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 but, you know. Uh, uh, okay, to that point, Councillor Adams, point of information. Facetious. Uh, this is an extremely important measure, and frankly, I, I, I've, been, I've been working all day. I've been at this meeting, as everybody else has been, since six, six, six o'clock. And I don't, I'm not doing. I don't, I don't vote no to be facetious, but this is big, big, important policy. It's going to affect the city for a very long time in a major way, and I just don't feel it's appropriate to to, to vote on something this substantial this late at night. I just that, that's the real okay, reason. So why we're I'm still there. debating the motion, Council Tacy. Yeah. Um, you can't debate a motion to end. The yeah, well, no, yeah, it's not a motion to it's not a This is a voting to, to extend suspend the rules. Who's been, what's the been, been waiting? That's that. She's been here all night. And she's waiting on a, a, an item? The motion is to suspend rules, and it still holds. Can, can you already can you switch to a roll call after you've already called to the ayes and nays? For clarity of the vote, yes. Okay. We have somebody who's been sitting here waiting for a particular okay. item. Just you change your vote to yes if you want. I mean, well, all right. So this is the motion to suspend rules, and the roll call, and the the clerk will call the roll. No. Uh, yes. Yes. Nay. Yes. 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 No. No. Okay. The motion carries. The rules have been suspended, and we are now proceeding with the rest of the meeting. Carolyn, uh, so as the floor, do you, have you, you feel comfortable with what you said so far? Do you want somebody? Uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing about sure. d design, if I could. That part of this whole process, even going back to the Sustainable Northampton plan, was that um, um, design, um, some aspects of design should be incorporated with any changes because there was a concern about um, neighborhood character. So. Um, through that, there was lots of debate about how much design is good, is there, is there too much, and so planning board tried to sort of go down the middle with that fine line and not go too far towards design, but also address the concerns that have been voiced over the years about that. Council Murphy. Mm -hmm. One of the, I mean, and, and there, there's a lot of work that has been done, but this body has its own work to do on this topic, and one of the, one of the unintended consequences of this that's going to play out with is regards to people's property values and their land assessments. The way assessors assess property is a primary site. And then if you have the potential to subdivide, you're assessed for a sec secondary site. And then you're assessed for excess land. If we reduce the minimum lot sizes in these zones, and a bunch of viable secondary sites, do you understand what I'm saying, pop up around the city, 
the assessors are going to increase people's property values because they now go from having just excess land to having a viable secondary site. So even people who choose not to take advantage of the potential to subdivide are going to have their land values increased because they do have that potential. And that certainly is something that's not necessarily the purview of the planning board, you know, or anybody else that's studied it to this point. But it is a real life consequence of what our constituents are going to run into down the road if, if we approve this. And this is more a political decision than a planning decision. But this is something that I think we need to consider at this level. And I don't think, you know, I don't know to what extent planning has done an impact study as to how many new building sites are going to get created, but they may well have done that. But this might be something we'd like the assessors to weigh in on just so we understand. I mean, increasing property value is good for our bottom line, but it, it probably will annoy some of our constituents who have no desire to subdivide but have their property values increased. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels, you were next, and then Councilor Carney, and then Councilor Fabulous. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, disagree, but in an interesting way with um, what uh, Councilor Murphy said earlier. Uh, some of these changes will take place and uh, very quickly. Um, we, we have uh, in Ward 3, which, is, which has most of the URC um, in the city, uh, I think. No? Your, um, ward 1 and, and right, 4 have quite a bit. We got, we got quite a bit of URC in the city. Um, we, uh, it, it, these, this zoning works pretty well. Uh, with, um, with bringing many lots into conformity and um, allowing for some reasonable infill. Uh, but on the margins, it's, it doesn't work as well. And um, I want to thank uh, OPD for working with, with me on, um, on, some of these, on some of the amendments, which you'll see in your, in your, um, that are included in this, uh, in this proposal. Um, and... Um, I think they go uh, a distance to alleviating some of the the concerns for the um, uh, for a lot of uh, for, for particularly a few streets that have lots that are way bigger than any other URC lot that you'll ever see. Um, but uh, but they don't go as far as they could, uh, and those are those are um, prime sites, and they're sites that uh, some some owners are just waiting to uh, put as many units as they can on. Um, so, you know, there will be some significant changes quickly, and, it, and it's not just Ward 3. It'll happen in, as, uh, as Mish said, it'll happen in 1 and, and uh, 4 as, as well. Uh, and it, um, it will be a surprise. And um, I think we've put some safeguards in, but uh, you, you could, there could be more safeguards added. There could be an upper limit perhaps um, to, uh, to development or, or a prima facie assumption about uh, high, about uh, high density uh, projects or something like that. Um, as it stands though, I, I, uh, I think this is uh, a really significant change to uh, many of the neighborhoods that we, uh, we value in this city. And in many ways, they'll stay the same or similar, but in some, edges and in a lot of the margins um, there'll be some big changes. Uh, <coughs> Councilor Carney and Councilor Taylor. <coughs> uh, uh, I'm fine. You're done? Councilor Specker? No. Nothing? Councilor Taylor. Yeah, just on my street I can see um, just off the top of my head pot on North Maple Street which is pretty congested. I can see six I'm trying to think now. I can see possibly six new new building lots um, that are ordinarily just. I mean, it will absolutely will change the neighborhood. It says I'm, I'm, it says uh, creates create a zone that reflects the way in which neighborhoods were originally laid out, and will eliminate nearly all non-conforming lot size in single-family homes. I, I I'm trying to. I'm trying to visualize what happened to North Maple Street. We have several houses that have big lots along the side of them. 
Um, they're, well, they're not that big, but according to this, they will be building lots. And I don't know. How can they be? I'm not really sure um, just exactly. I don't think the neighborhood would be would look at it favorably at all. Um, I just uh, my lot is only 50. I think it's 51 feet wide. There's 250 feet deep. Um, I wouldn't have any intention of. I mean, it's not wide enough. Um, and I share a driveway with the house next door. I mean, it's a, I, my, my, our neighborhood is. I, I think it's fantastic, and it's all non-conforming. It's all non-conforming, and so to bring it into conformity um, doesn't really turn my prop at all. I mean, uh, I love it just like it is. Whether it's conforming or non-conforming, it's, it's fine by me. So I sometimes I try to, but I'm not trying to expand my house either. So. Um, yeah, we it, there were there was a concern when we first um, raised or, or proposed the um, changes to the 50 foot frontage, and people were concerned that this is going to open up a whole lot of development. And we actually looked, um, tried to go through it as um, as detailed a manner as possible in each district. Um, how many new lots that really would mean and based on we looked at house lot location house structure location on a parcel and it ended up between the a b and c districts um, minimum less than one percent of total number of units within a zone up to just under five percent new lots could be created so um, on a, a percentage basis it ranged from one to four and a half percent um, of new lots over the existing. And, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that even if you have 100 feet of frontage, the house might be centrally located, so you couldn't subdivide it because you'd still need to maintain your setbacks on either side. So even though it looks like there might be lots of frontage on a parcel, that doesn't mean that you could necessarily subdivide it under the new rules. Council Murphy and then Council Robert. Um, just checking the calendar. Um, I'd like to move that we continue this discussion to our meeting on July 11th, because the next one's sort of a special meeting. Second. And would ask that if, if planning could take that infill analysis and talk to the assessors about it so we could, you know, that impact sort of concerns me because people don't see that one coming, and be able to report back to us mm -hmm. on that at that point in time so we can evaluate what that impact would be. Because I think it's something that, you know what wasn't the main focus of the planning board but it's going to have an impact on all of our constituents and just so we can throw that into the mix and evaluate it so what you think realistically the uh, info potential is and have the assessors sort of weigh in as to what that's going to actually change because the motions are made and seconded this is to the motion to and motion to the uh, just a, a question about the process I know at our ordinance committee meeting we talked about uh, a July 11th deadline for when we may need to post for uh, subsequent hearings. And then there was some confusion as to whether or not that's actually something that we need to do at the once it comes to this body. So I don't know if that's been clarified, if uh, you can speak to that. Or? I, I talked okay. to the solicitor today about that. And it's it's timed off when we closed our public hearing and our public hearing was held by ordinance on the 11th of June, correct? Monday the 11th of June. And Alan told me that the state statute says if we do not act on it within 90 days of then, we have to hold another public hearing to get another 90 days. So we have 90 days from the 11th of June September. So that gets us through September well, to deal with it. Yeah. And I'll just add that the reason that the, the um, change in that is that originally the city solicitor told us it was from the first public hearing that closes. So that meant the planning board. But that's been clarified so that we do have some extra time. Can I, uh, just clarification on that. Yes. Who has to hold the public? Can, this, can the council hold the public hearing? Or does it have to be the planning board? We, we no, it's, it's us. Council. Yeah, the council can hold the public hearing. Yeah, but we, we deferred that to ordinance, so our public hearing was held by the ordinance committee. But we, but in 
theory, we could hold the hearing ourselves. Yeah, yeah, we another could have hearing. another hearing, and we don't we don't need to for ninety yeah. days. But right. if we had another public hearing, the life of this issue could continue. Right, but you're safe for the eleventh for sure. We're safe till September at this point. Yeah. So we got some time. Council Labarge, did you have a question to yeah, the? I did. To the Does this also affect up in Leeds too? Mm. The yes, there are some A. To the yes, this is on the motion. I know, but I've had my hand up. I know, but, Councilor, that, that what was been proposed has been a, pro a postponement, so we will be, have an opportunity to. I'm going to tell you something, Councilor. Okay, I have my hand up throughout the night. And you pop over, you go from one person to another, and I just really feel bad about this. I, I apologize, okay, and, and I have no like your objection. And due respect, I do have my hand up. I I do, Councilor, and I'm trying to give everyone a fair opportunity to well, speak. In I apologize. Noted. Uh, Councilor Adams. I just want to say I support the motion and then also give us time if, if it passed to propose other amendments if there were some. Yeah. Any more comments just to the motion? One other comment to the motion Carolyn. would be it would also give us, if um, Carolyn, if you could bring in some of that other data that you we're just explaining a little piece of, of the percentages. I think that would be pretty helpful too to the kind of question that Councillor Tacey raised. So any other specific data like that in addition to Councillor Murphy's request, I think would be very helpful. And just to, if, it, uh, if it were to pass. Just so, so I can clarify what the request was, is the request to, um, seems like a pretty big one, to look at how uh, property values would be increased and there, there, and then the <coughs> consequence of that, how that increased property value would be assessed, so that would raise, uh, so that would show us what revenue would be generated. What I was interested in is, let's say there's a 100 or 200 or 150 or 125 new secondary sites are going to be created in the city by this so there's 100 or 125 residents who are going to see a pretty substantial land value increase in their property even if they choose to do nothing because if in fact it is a secondary building site it has greater value and their taxes are going to go up even if they don't take advantage and 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 that's one of the things that I'd like to be able to throw in the mix when I'm doing my job thinking about what do I right. want to do with it. And the, the only thing that that confusion that ra raises is, we, uh, is knowing how residents feel about increased property value. There's an assumption that people want to have their property right. worth more. It's uh, Council LaBarge and then Council Freeman Daniels. We can speak now. Well, we're speaking to the motion which is to postpone. Council, would you mind withdrawing your motion to permit a little bit more debate and then reoffering your motion your motion let me well, let me let me let me propose something here if if the councilors have some information that they would like Carolyn to provide us with the at the next time we convene on this issue for the postponed meeting um, now's the time to that's what I've been hearing from the other counselors and making requests of Carolyn to present information and other concerns. The, as to what areas it impacts, I think it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask even out of the, out of the uh, context of this meeting. And we're going to, and since if this motion passes, we are going to have a fair amount of time to ask all the questions that need to be asked relative to this issue. So if we want to extend this meeting for that purpose, that's fine. But if, if the, right now the motion is to postpone and it's been seconded, and I didn't hear Council Murphy accept <laughs> your offer. Well, I, I'm certainly willing to accept the request because once we, if we pass this, we're done talking about it and it's harder to make requests. So I certainly don't mind if people make requests of Carolyn for additional information on the 11th if we do vote to postpone. Council Tacey. Because I would also like to know what the Department of Revenue has for specifics on this with in respect to the assessor's office is it going to be automatic is it going to be uh, will they be taxed as undeveloped land or will it just be additional will it be a building lot 
Um, I, I just, you know, the DOR is pretty specific and pretty detailed on, on what they re, what they re request or require. I, as a matter of fact, it's what they demand. And I would wonder just exactly how this is going to affect the assessor's office. Well, that, maybe that would be a request best forwarded to the assessor's office as opposed to Carolyn here. But um, we could have the assessor weigh in on this. Yeah, I, I don't see any problem with that. Council I can certainly What's that? meet with them. <laughs> yeah, okay. Council LaBarge? So that's, I have concerns about that. That's why I wanted to talk to her. How can you actually say a piece of land is a building lot when there's no work being done on, no surveying or no perk testing? I don't, I don't get this. How come there's this concern here? Don't you have to still go through the same procedures going through the perk testing and the surveying and coming through planning so how can you actually go ahead and put a tax on somebody when it's not considered a building lot can can we if we have a request and what we'd like to hear at the next meeting if this if we could postpone this we could email it to the planning department and then they could come in with this and that gives us a chance to figure out what we want to do um, because we could probably kick this around uh, for this is it's, it's it's a huge package and I I'd like to move the uh, the the postponement question okay, okay. The, the question has been called uh, all those in favor of postponing the meeting please say aye uh, aye Ju July 11th July July. The July meeting please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed Sorry. abstentions Sorry. All right, Carolyn. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Carolyn. That's the lot. I have no updates other than to remind people that we will only have one meeting in July and one meeting in August. Although we do reserve the power to convene uh, special meetings as needed. But next week meeting, the next meeting is next week. <laughs> special meeting uh, is scheduled for the 27th. To, particularly the second reading up the budget. Motion Any other adjourn? There's a motion to adjourn. Second. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.